Behold, the beauty that is Indonesia. Mother Nature's gift of serene and colorful landscapes. Where diversity makes us one, united towards a common goal. Where resiliency is achieved together. A strong infrastructure governance arising where investments are waiting to flourish and where creativity is inspired by tradition. Indonesia, where beautiful possibilities are offered. Indonesia a land of breathtaking nature and rich culture. There are many things Indonesians are proud of. One-of-a-kind photogenic spots spread all over the nation, unique wildlife, magnificent cultural heritage, and the most recent one, the G20 Presidency. Indonesia is proud to hold the 2022 G20 Presidency. As a multilateral forum connecting the world's major economies, the G20 holds a strategic role in securing global economic growth and stability. Together, the G20 members represent more than 80% of world GDP, 75% of international trade, and 60% of the world population. And 2022 is the year that Indonesia plays a major role in leading the G20 discussions on various global issues. Not an easy task amid a global pandemic that still continues after more than two years. Holding the presidency in this unique moment where countries are struggling to bounce back from COVID-19, Indonesia introduces Recover Together, Recover Stronger as the main theme of its presidency. As a step toward an even sustainable recovery, six priority agendas are introduced in the finance track. Exit strategy to support recovery, addressing scarring effect to secure future growth, payment systems in the digital era, sustainable finance, digital financial inclusion, and international taxation. Through these agendas, the Indonesian Presidency aims to engage all G20 members and invitees in discussions and deliberations that goes beyond just the interest of advanced economies. Considerations also need to be put for other countries that may still be struggling to manage the pandemic. Because coming out of the pandemic, no one should be left behind. Recover together, recover stronger. Behold, the beauty that is Indonesia. Mother Nature's gift of serene and colorful landscapes. Where diversity makes us one, united towards a common goal. Where resiliency is achieved together. A strong infrastructure governance arising where investments are waiting to flourish and where creativity is inspired by tradition. Indonesia, where beautiful possibilities are offered. Indonesia a land of breathtaking nature and rich culture. There are many things Indonesians are proud of. One-of-a-kind photogenic spots spread all over the nation, unique wildlife, magnificent cultural heritage, and the most recent one, the G20 Presidency. Indonesia is proud to hold the 2022 G20 Presidency. As a multilateral forum connecting the world's major economies, the G20 holds a strategic role in securing global economic growth and stability. Together, 
the G20 members represent more than 80% of world GDP, 75% of international trade, and 60% of the world population. And 2022 is the year that Indonesia plays a major role in leading the G20 discussions on various global issues. Not an easy task amid a global pandemic that still continues after more than two years. Holding the presidency in this unique moment where countries are struggling to bounce back from COVID-19, Indonesia introduces Recover Together, Recover Stronger as the main theme of its presidency. As a step toward an even sustainable recovery, six priority agendas are introduced in the finance track. Exit strategy to support recovery, addressing scarring effect to secure future growth, payment systems in the digital era, sustainable finance, digital financial inclusion, and international taxation. Through these agendas, the Indonesian Presidency aims to engage all G20 members and invitees in discussions and deliberations that goes beyond just the interest of advanced economies. Considerations also need to be put for other countries that may still be struggling to manage the pandemic. Because coming out of the pandemic, no one should be left behind. Recover together, recover stronger. Behold, the beauty that is Indonesia. Mother Nature's gift of serene and colorful landscapes. Where diversity makes us one, united towards a common goal. Where resiliency is achieved together. A strong infrastructure governance arising where investments are waiting to flourish and where creativity is inspired by tradition. Indonesia, where beautiful possibilities are offered. Indonesia a land of breathtaking nature and rich culture. There are many things Indonesians are proud of. One-of-a-kind photogenic spots spread all over the nation, unique wildlife, magnificent cultural heritage, and the most recent one, the G20 Presidency. Indonesia is proud to hold the 2022 G20 Presidency. As a multilateral forum connecting the world's major economies, the G20 holds a strategic role in securing global economic growth and stability. Together, the G20 members represent more than 80% of world GDP, 75% of international trade, and 60% of the world population. And 2022 is the year that Indonesia plays a major role in leading the G20 discussion.
Ladies and gentlemen, before we start, allow me to greet His Excellency, Governor of Bank Indonesia, Bapak Peri Warjio. And also allow me to greet our guest of honors, Governor of Saudi Central Bank, Mr. Fahad Al Mubarak. <laughs> Deputy Governor, Bank of England, Chair of the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructures, and Co Chair of Financial Stability Board Cross Border Payments Coordination, Sir John Cunliffe. Managing Director, Monetary Authority of Singapore, Mr. Ravi Menon. <laughs> Governor of Bank Negara Malaysia, Ms. Nur Shamsiah Muhammad Yunus. <laughs> Deputy Governor of Bank of Thailand, Mr. Ronadol Numnonora. Governor of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, Mr. Felipe Medalia. <laughs> Head of Bank for International Settlement Innovation Hub Singapore, Mr. Andrew McCormack. <laughs> Division Chief in the Monetary and Capital Markets Department, International Monetary Fund, Mr. Tommaso Mancini Grifoli. Co-Chair of Cross-Border Payment Messaging Workstream and Chief General Manager at Department of Payment and Settlement System, Reserve Bank of India, Mr. P. Vasudevan. And also, Anggota Komisi 11 DPR RI, Bapak Andreas Edi Susetio, Bapak Kamrus Samad, dan Bapak Didi Irawadi Syamsuddin. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to the part of G20 Indonesia Presidency, Indonesian Digital Financial Economic Festival 2022. This year, we bring the theme Advancing Digital Economy and Finance through Synergistic and Inclusive ex Ecosystem for Accelerated Recovery. This event is broadcasted live from Bali, the Paradise Island in Indonesia. And at this valuable moment, please allow me, Dazen Frila, to have a privilege of serving you as Master of Ceremony. We certainly hope everyone who is joining today is in good health. Ladies and gentlemen, Bank Indonesia with the Coordinating Ministry for Economics Affairs have successfully collaborated to organize the first Indonesian Digital Financial Economy Festival event in 2021. By promoting collaboration and synergy between ministries and institutions, as well as associations and all industry players in the digital financial economy ecosystem, here we are coming with the second Indonesian Digital Financial Economy Festival, or FECDI 2022. And ladies and gentlemen, today, is the fourth day of FECD 2022 with a topic of cross-border payment. And to start our agenda for today, we would like to invite His Excellency Governor of Bank Indonesia, Bapak Peri Warjio, to lead the Leaders Talk session. Bapak Peri, the stage is yours. Very good morning to all of you. His Excellency, Governor of Saudi 
Arabia Monetary Authority, Governor Fahad, His Excellency Mr. John Conley, Deputy Governor of Bank of, uh, of England, as well as Chair of Cross-Border Payment and Market Infrastructure, as well as also, what, what is John? Co-Chair of Cross-Border Payment Committee under Financial Supervisory Board. My fellows, ASEAN 5, Governor of Central Bank, Excellency of Member of Parliament, my colleagues of the Central Bank, BIS Innovation Hub, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, very good morning to all of you. Come on, guys. What a great day. Over the past decade, payment system has changed radically. We see a number and many innovation of digital financial innovation. A payment system has taken safe and more innovation every day. It's coming to the fore. Development on payments aspect from products, technology, as well as also across perspective, making them un uh, accessible and achieve efficiency for our economy. Over the past two years of COVID, of course, digital payment system and digital economy finance as a game changer for supporting not only global economy, but also economy around the globe, including also in Indonesia. Furthermore, it creates a lower market entry barriers, improve productivity, and thus achieving sustainable and inclusive economic growth. But of course, this very great achievement without any challenges. On the other side, cross-border payments are still faced challenges such as high cost, slow speed, limited access, and lack of transparency. Therefore, international cross-border cooperation needs to be strengthened in light of this increasing economic and financial digitalization, including accelerating digitalization towards economic and financial inclusion, such as remittances, retail trades, as well as micro and small medium enterprises. Ladies and gentlemen, now, the future is here. Really, the future of digitalization is here. The issue of global initiative for accelerating economic and financial digitalization has been a global initiative. And G20, all together with financial supervisory board, already agree to strengthening and advancing cross-border payments as one of the priorities under Saudi Arabia leadership presidency in 2020. G20 already launched G20 cross-border payment roadmap in to address the challenges of cross-border payment and to provide guidance on how to develop payment connectivity. This year, under Indonesia Presidency of G20 in 2022, we raised the theme of Recover Together, Recover Stronger. And digital payment and advancing cross-border payment initiative is one of priority under agenda under Indonesia Presidency. And in this aspect, we already agree, G20 with FSV, to advance the progress of cross-border initiative toward 2027. And in, in this regard, G20 Indonesia Presidency pay attention on building and pursuing interlinking of payment system for cross-border payment, as well as also harmonizing protocol of data exchange. Of course, the FSB. Cross-Border Payment Coordination Group, CPC, will monitor the implementation of the G20 Cross-Border Payment Roadmap. Other works under G20 and FSB is on how we, we need to advance 
on the development of cross center bank digital currency. We recognize that the implication of CBDC go well beyond national border. It underscores the need for multilateral collaboration to achieve collective understanding of CBDC, as well as on how we increase collaboration to advance col and to understand better implication of cross-border use of CBDC, including on supporting economic growth, financial and economic inclusion, as well as on international monetary system. Thus, also under G20 initiative this year. And beyond that, FSB already also issue regulatory and super and monitoring from work for the crypto on digital financial asset. So they will support the economic growth, financial inclusion, but also cater the need for risk mitigation. Those are global initiatives that we will discuss on the first session. And we are honored to have Governor of Saudi Arabia Monetary, which initiated under Saudi Arabia of G20 FSB roadmap of cross-border payment. And we also have extraordinary privilege to have His Excellency John McLeaf, uh, John Canlev which is catering as also monitoring the progress of those cross-border toward this year. In the second session, we will move to regional. Regional in ASEAN. Under ASEAN economic integration, ASEAN financial integration, we already have a roadmap of ASEAN payment connectivity. We already built a strategic business plan. And with global initiative, we try to interlink regional initiative and the global initiative. But beyond that, the ASEAN Five Central Bank this year will lead the way for implementation of cross-border payment. We will start with cross-border initiative under ASEAN Five, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand and the Philippines will start it to have a collective cross-border payment connectivity on the QR, on the fast payment, and the use of local currency. And we are honored to have the leader of ASEAN 5 Central Bank, and the second session will give a vision and roadmap, as well as the work plan toward ASEAN 5 cross-border payment connectivity on the QR, fast payment, and local currency. Ladies and gentlemen, those are moving on the global and regional initiative. Cross-border payment is one of agenda under G20 Indonesia presidency. Second, global initiative already underway, becoming accelerating and progressing. And beyond that, third, ASEAN 5 will giving a showcase for moving forward, a collective ASEAN 5 cross-border payment. Without further ado, I will invite online Governor of Saudi Arabia Monetary Authority, Governor Fahad, to be on screen, please, if it's already on, this, on screen. And also, I will invite His Excellency Sir John Canliff to be on, on the stage with me. He is a chair of CPMI and co-chair FSB CVC. John, please, and give a round of applause. Very good morning, Governor Fahad. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum and good morning to everyone. I hope I am audible. Well, of course, we see how healthy you are. We hope that you 
will be yeah. you know healthy i miss you really my dear friend governor uh, fahad let the uh, ladies and give uh, a support and big applause to governor saudi arabia monetary of uh, his excellency governor dr fahad al mubarak governor oh, thank you thank you very much governor fahad thank you. governor fahad yes, yes everybody want to hear for you back in 2020 where we are initiated a global initiative of cross-border payment we thank you for saudi arabia leadership under g20 initiative the first in history under g20 fsb collaborative on agreeing the roadmap for international cross-border payment system so please Elaborate us on the. Well, thank you thank you very much. Uh, Please do. Thank you very much, uh, Governor Perry, and I really appreciate your kind words. Um, and let me first apologize for not being uh, having the honor of being uh, among you in the Paradise uh, Island of uh, Perry and the beautiful country of Indonesia, uh, and and thank the uh, presidency of the Indonesian the G20 for a great uh, phenomenal uh, year, a challenging year, but uh, great progress in all fronts. And I think uh, this meetings of finance ministers and governors uh, highlight the excellent work that you have been doing across the board, especially in the financial uh, sector. Uh, we really appreciate it and very much appreciate uh, making uh, cross-border payment roadmap as part of uh, your presidency uh, with the participation and involvement of FSP and the excellent work of uh, CPMI. I'm honored to share stage with uh, your excellencies, uh, yourself, and also uh, my good friend, uh, John Canleff, uh, for uh, excellent work for carrying out uh, throughout uh, uh, the time. <clears throat> I will focus my remarks on uh, three issues. Uh, first, a brief uh, of the significance of the G20 cross road, uh, cross border roadmap and uh, region. Then I will share with you some regional case studies in the Middle East. Uh, as you have the Asian five, we have the GCC six, and I'd like to share with you our experience. Then I will just uh, highlight some of the initiatives in Saudi Arabia and our experience in digital payment. We consider the G20 cross-border payment roadmap to be really a significant initiative for global world economy and to accelerate economic recovery. It has been well documented in various studies that there are significant challenges with cross-border payments such as high cost, low speed and limited access and transparency, as well as frictions like the process required to ensure enhanced uh, ad adherence to compliance requirements, lack of interoperability and outdated technologies. Recognizing these challenges under the G20 presidency, as Your Excellency have just stated in 2020, enhancing cross-border payment was made a top priority under uh, financial regulation agenda. To that end, the FSP, in coordination with CPMI, along with international organization and standard setting bodies, set out to develop a roadmap for enhancing cross-border arrangement globally. Today, I'm privileged to share the stage with yourself and John, who will give us more important update on the progress today. Faster, cheaper, more transparent, and more inclusive cross-border payment service, include remittance, will have widespread benefits for citizens and economic and economies worldwide, supporting economic growth, international trade, global development, and financial inclusion. The G20 roadmap on enhancing cross-border payment and its 19 building blocks seeks to deliver against those needs. This roadmap 
sets out a high-level plan and timeline to implement the agreed action under such building blocks. These 19 building blocks are expected to bring significant benefits to cross-border payments arrangement over time and are categorized into five focuses, public and private sector commitment, regulatory supervision and oversight framework, data and market practice, existing payment infrastructure and building a new payment infrastructure and arrangements. The G20 roadmap is very ambitious, multi-year, multi-dimensional program, which involves very significant collaboration by the various relevant international organizations, expert groups, standard setting bodies, and indeed individual jurisdictions. It will also have considerable consideration and engagement from the private sector. As I am sure you are all well aware, the specific targets under the heading of cost, speed, access, and transparency have been determined and endorsed by the G20 at the end of last year. These have been published on the FSP website and are set out for a various market segment, i.e. wholesale, retail, and remittances. In Saudi Arabia, we are very supportive of the work done so far by all stakeholders in terms of implementation. The Saudi Central Bank remains involved in all stages of development of the roadmap, while our colleagues in the FSP and the CPMI in the various uh, working groups and task force that have been set up to deliver on the action set out at the, in the report. Now, I want to turn the, on the Middle East region specifically and mention some initiatives in the in relation to enhancing cross-border payment that are that have been work that we have been working on for some time, and it has been recently operational. Namely, the Gulf Cooperation countries, six countries, sponsored AFAR, cross-border payment service, and the Arab Monetary Fund have sponsored BUNA, cross-border payment service. Both of these initiatives deliver on a number of objectives within various building blocks, including a new multilateral platform with liquidity bridge that operates in real time, facilitated by settlement in central banks. AFAR, through a new multilateral platform, links RTGSs, systems of GCC countries' central banks. The system is multi-jurisdictional, system under system, underbent by legal, regulatory, and governance framework developed by GCC countries. It eliminates long transaction chain as no correspondence banks are necessary to intermediate in the chain. There are common data standards for payment messages, which supports interoperability. The costs associated with funding and settlement are greatly reduced through the use of multilateral setting, netting with settlement activities handled by existing RTGSs. Foreign exchange risk is mitigated by central bank interday guarantee of exchange rates. The system is accessed through the payment gateway using standard API, which support authorization, security, and scalability. We, we can see significant benefits to this type of approaches in terms of addressing many of the frictions associated with cross-border payments and identified in the G20 roadmap, particularly in the friction of long transaction chains. Looking at the current global economic situation, the world is, uh, the world is in the process of recovery from an anticipated pandemic event of 2020 and the unprecedented impact that it had on economic development. While COVID-19 had the negative effect of slowing down economic development and production globally, we know that it also had a significant stimulus effect in our payment, payments world uh, of accelerating the adoption of digital means. In Saudi Arabia, consumer adoption of digital payment during 2021 have witnessed an access of 80% growth 
in the card payment space, which was mirrored by a huge reduction in the cash payment. In parallel, the domestic payment activities in Saudi Arabia experienced over 100% growth in e-commerce for the same period, reflecting, reflecting an increased preference with digital market uh, place. During this time, the Saudi Central Bank took proactive steps to uh, enhance both consumer and merchant engagement with digital payment instrument was made as easy as possible. Such actions include raising contactless value uh, threshold for card payment, supporting merchant access to non-cash payment technology through our universal access program, and direct subsidies to merchant service charges. Additionally, international remittances costs were reduced to support use of digital channels. This is significant because Saudi Arabia is the third largest source of remittance, remittances globally, mainly to developing countries. I very much look forward to the various presentations during the day, which will further explore the benefits and challenges interlinkage near real-time cross-border payment. Let us not forget that cross-border payment are complex, involving multiple jurisdictions, multiple time zones, and different currencies. To appropriately address the challenges in this space, we require a comprehensive program, which need not only building on the technology enhancement and digital enablement, but also working on the other layers and streams, including other service components, pre-existing international agreements, rules and regulations among jurisdictions. The G20 cross-border cross roadmap acknowledge all these complexities and challenges. We are keen to continue our uh, cooperation with our Indonesian colleagues and the G20 and also FSP and CPM and other international organization enhancing cross-border payments initiatives, and we will continue to offer our full support. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Governor Fahad. Like a big applause to Governor Fahad, please. <laughs> Don't go away, Governor Fahad. Uh, we will come back to you in more uh, discussion. That's 2020. Really, under Saudi Arabia presidency, set out the, and driving future faster, cheaper, more transparent, and inclusive cross border payment. With that vision, last year, FSB under cross border payment coordination group, as well as also on the cross border payment market infrastructure. Working closely with the, with the G20, moving forward from the vision into reality. Setting out the destination statement, the target, the ambitious target. Setting out also strategies, but beyond that, also program, concrete program with performance indicators. My recollection was 18, one eight building block, and I forget. But who is the man behind it? It is His Excellency, Sir John Canliff. He is a co-chair of FSB Cross-Border Coordination Payment Group, as well as also chair of Cross-Border Payment Market Infrastructure. So, Sir John Panlip, I know it's very hard work to coordinate all the works, but we are making progress. FSB, G20, agreeing on from the vision into reality, setting out the outcome, Decision, strategy, program, so John, and thank like you. us. Thank you very much, um, Governor Perry. And look, thank you also for um, your hospitality and the Indonesian G20 hospitality and for inviting me back to this wonderful island. So uh, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to come back and also to talk uh, about this program 
There's a little health warning before I start. I had a case of COVID a few weeks back. It's gone, but the cough is still there. So if I cough a little, just bear with me. I'll have some water and we'll continue. So I'll say a few words about the roadmap and, and what it is, uh, and then where we are now, and uh, just some indications of what we, uh, what we need to do next. There are, as I think the governor said, 19 building blocks. I'm not going to take you through. You'll be relieved to know each one uh, in detail, but I'll give you a little bit of a, uh, a flavor. I'll, I'll start first with uh, the why and the what. And the why, as the governor uh, has said, is we've seen great improvements in domestic payment systems. We're seeing great advances in technology. <laughs> but cross-border payments have lagged, have lagged behind. And they're a little bit the forgotten child of the payments uh, world. They are, as has been said, um, relative to what happens domestically now, slow, expensive, unreliable, untransparent, and actually, in some parts of the world, simply not available uh, to, uh, to people. Um, and um, uh, this was crystallized, I think, in, um, uh, back in 20, 2018 uh, with the launch of the, the Libra DM stablecoin by Facebook. And suddenly, uh, public authorities and the private sector, the banks, were looking at competition potentially from a crypto coin. Um, and it just shone the spotlight as to why there was this opportunity uh, for Facebook and others. And of course, the opportunity was there because we weren't providing the cross-border payment services, I think, that are possible today and that are, are necessary today. So uh, the G20... <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> um, asked the FSB to look at why <coughs> cross-border payments had lagged behind and then to develop a roadmap for improvement. Um, so the, the FSB, through the CPMI, uh, which I chair, looked at the different frictions, what was holding back cross-border payment development. It's a complex, uh, as been said, multi-dimensional problem. It requires political will, which I think is one of the reasons I'm so pleased to be able to talk about it at this G20. Uh, it requires infrastructure improvements, regulation, competition, standards uh, and law, and it requires both public sector authorities, central banks, regulatory authorities, and crucially the private sector to come together to make some of these uh, improvements. Um, and um, uh, we, we, uh, the roadmap, I think, is best thought of as a program of actions and encouragement to deal with each of those, uh, each of those frictions. And the key building block and it's been mentioned, is building block one, which sets outcome targets. Not targets for inputs, not even targets for outputs, reports, but targets for the speed, the cost, uh, the access, the transparency uh, that we want to see. And they're, they're concrete. The cost, for example, on, um, uh, on wholesale, uh, oh, sorry, on retail, is average payment cost of 1%, and for remittances, the United Nations target of 3%. Speed, an example for wholesale, 75% of wholesale payments within one hour. Access, again, for remittances, more than 90% of people who need access should have access. So these are actually quantified numerical uh, targets. And they're important because they provide the accountability, and I hope will provide the political will to keep this program moving forward. And against that background, I'll make four general points and then talk a little bit about the program. The first general point is we should not underestimate the difficulty uh, of, uh, of this challenge. It's best illustrated by the fact that though we have those outcome targets, we do not yet have the metrics to measure progress against them. There is a technical experts group that's now put out a consultation document on what metrics we should measure to see how, how we're doing. Uh, but up to now, we haven't had the ability to measure what was happening in this world. And as we all know, uh, what gets measured gets done. Or to put it another way, if you don't measure it, it doesn't get done. So, so um, uh, the complexity here requires that framework of accountability. 
Second point I'll make of the good news is we're now nearly two years in. We are on track. We've laid the foundation. Um, I'll talk a, a bit about that. We've done um, detailed analysis of the frictions, assessment of what is happening in different, in different jurisdictions, uh, development of templates uh, and best practice and guides to help people uh, tackle uh, these frictions. So the good news is we're on track. The challenging news is we now have to move from that foundation to the implementation of practical projects that will make payments faster, will make them cheaper, uh, will make them more accessible. And that next stage requires public sector and private sector uh, actors to develop and implement, as I say, practical uh, projects. To put it bluntly, uh, the Financial Stability Board, the G20, cannot build RTGS systems. Um, the, the, uh, the G20 can't provide customer services. What we have to do is provide the framework in which those things uh, go forward. Um, and um, my third point is it is a roadmap. It's a map. It shows where progress has to be made. It shows who has to make the progress. It provides guidance about how to make that progress. Some of the best practice guides, assessment guides we've produced help with that. But it is a map of the roads. You have to get the cars to move down the roads uh, as well as uh, provide the map. And that's some of the examples I will give later. And my fourth point is it's very unlikely that there will be one answer to making uh, cross-border payments more effective. The roadmap covers wholesale, it covers retail, business to business, uh, business to, uh, to consumer, peer to peer, and it covers remittances separately which have a, a whole different set of challenges in some corridors. Uh, it's possible that we one solution that, that does everything for every business use case uh, in every corridor uh, in every region. But my own view is that's, that is unlikely. Payments today is a very complicated landscape with different use cases uh, in different uh, parts of the world, and that will continue. What we can do is to try and um, catalyze the developments in the different areas uh, and also provide some things which are of general application, so um, better, more efficient implementation of anti-money laundering, counter-terrorist financing, uh, for example, will help across the board. Data standards will help across the board. But this will be taken forward, this program will be taken forward in different ways, in different places. So let me just talk a little bit about that. Um, as I say, the payments landscape has got different use cases, channels, corridors, business models. You can simplify it into, into three, I call it generations of technology and business model. So the oldest generation is correspondent banking. It's been around uh, for centuries. Um, it's, uh, it's mature, it's long established, it's where the largest payments uh, move. Um, the next generation is what I call the maturing technologies that have been implemented over the last... <laughs> <laughs> the last 10 or 15 years, automated clearing houses, faster payment services uh, for retail, and then the prospective technologies, CBDCs and stablecoin. So I'll start with the last, the prospective technologies. <laughs> These get a lot of attention. Everybody wants to talk about CBDC. Um, right now, um, some people don't want to talk so much about stablecoin or crypto, uh, but these are the subjects uh, of the moment. Uh, these, these offer opportunities for the future, but the targets, the outcome targets I talked about are for 2027. And I think it's quite unlikely that we're going to have a range of global CBDCs up and operating by 2027. So I think about that generation as laying the groundwork for what happens after, uh, after the, um, uh, the targets have been met, but they do offer great potential. And the priority, I think, for the private uh, side of this, crypto, is to put in place the regulatory framework that enables that technology to be used safely without the sorts of things we've seen happen over, over the last month. 
and that has to be grounded on the principle uh, of same risk, same regulatory outcome, and CPMI OSCO have just issued guidance uh, for standards for the use of crypto um, uh, stable coins uh, in payment systems. On CBDC, uh, we've produced with the World Bank, the IMF and the BIS um, a report for this G20 meeting on how to start to think about building cross-border international thinking into domestic thinking about CBDC. Central banks all around the world are thinking about CBDC. We have a clean slate opportunity to think about the cross-border um, possibilities at an early stage rather than as has happened with established payment systems to let them develop and then discover that we can't bring them uh, together. So those, I think, is where the priorities are um, on those. On correspondent banking, we need to improve what we have. And that comes down to things like um, extending the opening hours of central bank RTGS systems. The main um, jurisdictions opening hours, they're only open together uh, for five hours out of 24, um, if, you, if you look across uh, the world, which means that cross-border payments have to wait uh, in one jurisdiction uh, until the system opens. When I say to the payment experts at the Bank of England, we need 24-7 operation, they tell me just how difficult uh, that is to achieve. But nonetheless, central banks, I think, have a big role in just extending the opening hours for their uh, real-time growth settlement systems and also providing more access uh, to non-bank players. And that's very difficult for some central banks for legal uh, and other reasons. In the Bank of England, we have actually, along with other central banks, offered access to the central payment rails to non-banks. I know it's difficult, but one of the reasons we have the problems we have in cross-border payments is there isn't enough competition. And I think central banks need to be instrumental uh, in opening up that world. And the last priority, I'd say, on correspondent banking is messaging ISO 2022 is, um, is being adopted around the world. But of course, ISO 2022 is, is a data standard. You then have to decide what should go into it uh, for, uh, for different types of payment. And that means the public and the private sector need to come together around those standards. And very quickly, I'll talk about the last area, which is the maturing technologies, retail, the linking up of faster payment services, which I think in a way is the most exciting uh, area in all of this because so much is happening. You've talked, Governor, about what's happening in ASEAN uh, and, and this region. Um, uh, we've heard what is happening uh, in, uh, in the Middle East. Experiments are happening uh, all over the world. In Europe, you have the, uh, uh, the ECB TIP system, which is now bringing in actually foreign currency uh, with the accession uh, of the Swedes. I think there are some common issues here. One issue is governance. Uh, if you interlink payment systems, uh, retail payment systems, how do you get the governance? How do you get uh, the common standards? Uh, one big issue here is also the APIs, which are the connectors that enable different systems to talk to each other. And there for the Indonesian G20, CPMI has produced a report, my good friend Vasu will talk about it uh, later on, on how to interlink payment systems the considerations that people have to uh, have in mind, uh, and how to standardize a bit more the APIs, which are the connectivity uh, in the system. But this is an area where I think um, the possibility of making huge progress, um, and we're seeing some of that in different regions. So to, to sum up, um, I think we've laid the foundation. Uh, we have the platform to go forward. We can see now more clearly the priorities, the things we need to concentrate on, we can use, as public authorities, central banks, our convening power to bring the private sector uh, in. We can use our ability to look at the various things that are happening regionally and try and ensure some consistency and make sure that lessons that are learned in one part of the world are actually spread uh, to another part of the world. And we can encourage projects to come forward. And we'll hear about, I think, some of those projects uh, in, the, in the second session. So I think I'm optimistic about the future, but the next steps we have to take are big steps, and we have to maintain that political support. So again, thank you to the Indonesian G20 for putting this on the agenda and giving it such prominence. Thank you.
Big applause to John Gunlev, please. So, ladies and gentlemen, you see, this is not a vision. This is concrete. This is real. It's ambitious, as we, of course. A vision need to be ambitious, but achievable collectively to move and to advance the global digitalization. How we do economic and financial transaction from corresponding banking being improved. But beyond that, capitalizing the fast growing technology digital. With digital technology, connectivity around the globe becoming visible and implementable. And the cross-border payment just do that. Faster, cheaper, but catering the need of inclusive, sustainable, and global economic growth. Three words that I can summarize. The five program that John mentioned. Faster. What do we mean by faster? Which is interconnectivity, interoperability of the payment infrastructure. This is digital technology make the vision come true. With the digital technology, the inter operably interconnect of the infrastructure, whether fast payment, whether real-time gross settlement, and including also the development of CBDC, a public-private digital currency. And later on, we will have the liberty of the initiative, global initiative, on the digital technology initiative, with the project of Nexus and the BIS and other project along the way of any global and regional institute to connect the fan payment system infrastructure, the first infrastructure. The second is about efficiency, the clarity of low cost, which is the pricing. This is very difficult achievement, but g and FEC make true the targeting within five and six years, how to have a low cost remittances, low cost of transfer across border and any payment and financial transaction fee. Infrastructure, pricing, and the third, regulatory. This is regulatory is very important. Not only to address anti money laundering, counter tourism, but regulatory on the cyber, regulatory of, on the payment system, and as well as later on, regulatory framework on the CBDC and so on. The IPR, infrastructure, pricing, regulatory. If I can summarize the three key words. Let's move on. First, of course, this is internal cooperation. I will ask Governor Fahad will initiate and John later on, how difficult it is to get things together. So the audience can understand the G20 and FAC working together. I call it the power of we. If we get together, things, the vision becoming come true. Let me just come back to Governor Fahad. The, the challenges to have international coordination, agreeing and moving to the vision. And later, later on, John, you can share how actually from the differences, but the spirit of together, then we agreeing on the some of this target as as program on the building block. Governor of Ahad, please, can you share with us how we can succeed on strengthening the collaboration of G20 as well as as we to this making the dream come true. Governor of Ahad, please. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Governor Perry. I really uh, enjoyed uh, your remarks and John's remarks. Uh, and indeed, uh, as has always been said, global challenges require global cooperation. And this is what, is what it is all about. And that's why we are here in this place uh, uh, to discuss common issues and find common solutions. Indeed, 
technology have brought great things and will continue and we should continue also adapting it. However, it also brings a lot of challenges. We have been able to work with our comfort zones, our banks, and implement all the regulatory aspects and the monitoring aspects of compliance, especially in uh, uh, money laundering and prison financing, and been able to control it to a great extent. Now we are moving to a new era, the digital globalization. And central banks are playing a catch-up game in order to cope with the new advances and the requirement. We need to continue enhancing our systems, adopting new technologies, and bringing up our capabilities internally in central banks. In the International Fora, the Financial Stability Board, and its all committees, as well as the BIS, we are working hard together in order to coordinate. We can always build the best systems domestically, but that's not enough. What is enough is this project, a cross-border. If we don't get that right, we'll not be able to create those systems. Costs are too high, too slow, not transparent, and we need to fix that. And if we don't, in the central banks, other players will come in that we don't recognize them, and we are trying to create the right mechanism like central bank digital currencies that, as John said, have been developed across most of the major central banks around the world, more than 65 central banks, not only domestically, but there are seven different experiments around the world on experimenting with cross-border. Because we could always make a very successful local CBDC. The challenge is a cross-border. And yes, those experiments are working. We in Saudi Arabia had an experiment with United Arab Emirates in a project called uh, ABAR, mm. where, uh, ABR, and where we been able to successfully experiment with four commercial banks and two central banks where it was a very successful experience. We need to project that experience across many other countries. And importantly is as we are moving into this fast forward, fast world of uh, digitalization, we need to keep maintaining the world payment safe from any fraudulent interference or any solicit financing or any terrorism financing or uh, uh, terrorism financing. This is, uh, uh, an, uh, or money laundering. These are extremely important to keep in mind and these are the major concerns of central banks. So yes, indeed, we need to develop our monetary international uh, system and we need to work harder and faster and be ahead of the curve. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Fahad. Turn to you, John. I know it's how difficult, you know, you as a co-chair of uh, CPC and a chair of CPMI, but how you succeeded in getting together. Share with us on that. So I think the, the first thing I'd say, and I touched on this, I think um, you have as well, and Governor Fahad has, um, without political will, this will not happen. So uh, we need to keep the G20, uh, not just the central bank governors, but the finance ministers focused uh, on this task. And that's why those targets and measuring progress against those targets are, as I said, so important um, at just keeping the, the energy going. I think the, um, uh, without, if you like, the initial launch from the Saudi uh, presidency, we wouldn't be where we are, but we have to keep that momentum up. I know the Indian G20 presidency proposes to take this forward, but there is no substitute for continued political attention and political focus. And we need to bring home, I think, to the political side, just the benefits uh, that we could get. I think now cross-border payments in 2017 were about $150 trillion uh, forecast to go up to $250 trillion. 
uh, by 2027. So the economic benefits of reducing mm. frictions um, are key. Uh, the more we can lower frictional costs for SMEs yes. and for individuals cross-border, I think the more um, we build back better to, okay. to, to come to, to that phrase. The second point, um, I think, is, is actually we have another big partner in this called the private sector. Mm. And it's not just the banks, it's the banks and the fintechs and others. And we can use our political and our regulatory uh, convening power to bring them together for solutions which they won't find by themselves mm. uh, because there are collective action issues. And bluntly, for some, the business model is very comfortable, the rents are very high, and they have no incentive uh, to, to, to tackle this. So I'm hoping we're gonna have a high-level summit um, from the FSB, bringing the private sector in at the top level. Uh, all the different parts of the private sector, they're in, some of them are in competition with each other, to get across the message that the status quo will not last. Mm. And actually they have to buy into this and that means investment. I'll give an example. Uh, we did a report on extending the opening hours of central bank RTGS systems. There is no point in central banks extending their opening hours if the correspondent banks mm. don't operate. Otherwise, as somebody said, it's like clapping with one hand. Mm. And some of the private sector banks don't want to invest they don't, I mean, as I say, they're comfortable. It doesn't matter to them if a payment has to wait 18 hours. Um, it's, more, uh, it's more convenient the way they are. So we have to use the G20 and the FSB, that convening power to bring the private set together. And the last thing I think we have to do, and this is why I'm so pleased you've got Andrew McCormack of the BIS Innovation Hub here and, and the, the whole work. <coughs> 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 the BIS has done, we have to bring the practical mm. into this program. The, <coughs> the experimentation that's taken place yes. and the things that are being done and learn from each other mm. uh, in that way. And I think we now have some really good, uh, really good examples. I say some of the problems, whether you're wholesale CBDC or retail payments in Asia, what's the governance when you want to yeah. bring countries together? You know, how do you decide who makes the decisions? How do you decide who decides on the standards? You know, how, how, um, how many people do you have around the table if you have a multilateral platform? Those are issues I think we can solve together and try and have some consistency. Thank you, John. And of course, uh, from Saudi Arabia to Italy to Indonesia and next year to India. I think continuation of this implementation of cross border payment roadmap, making the dream come true. And this is also the vision I will come back to Governor Fahad to have uh, his uh, closing remark. What, Governor Fahad, what you can advise to G20, SSV, as well as us, fellow central bankers, making the dream come true, political, as well as also the area on the infrastructure connectivity, on the pricing, as well as on the regulatory forward. How we need mm -hmm. to move forward on this agenda. Governor Fahad, your closing remark, please. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, uh, we need to stay the course. I fully agree with you that uh, launching cross-border uh, payment uh, in the G Saudi G20 presidency 2020, being carried uh, through very well by Italy and again by Indonesia, and needs, as John said, continue the work by India and even Brazil, is very important. This is a non-stop work. We need to continue improving it. I think that the political will is there, and we need to use that in order to implement. Everything global requires standardization. And we look at the BIS and the Innovation Hub to help us standardize how we should design our CBDCs in order to ex uh, uh, expedite the implementation of cross-border CBDC exchanges. That is very important. 
we as central banks need to continue enhancing our local payment systems. We should embrace fintechs uh, and embrace technologies and keeping in mind at all times that uh, anti-money laundering and uh, combating terrorism financing are a major part of monitoring any development of any new system. These are important for development, and we have no option but to pursue these avenues. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Fahad. A big applause to Governor Fahad once again. It's a closing uh, remark. I come back to John, how we move forward. I know it's a big work. We have a political, we need to be continued, and how to implement on this more concrete program, John. Well, I've said a lot about um, keeping it in the political, uh, very much in the political spotlight, uh, and the work we have to do now at the technical level to, to fill in the next steps of the roadmap. And I've also talked a bit about trying to take some of the practical experimentation, learning from it and moving across. I'll make one last point. I think the regional aspect here is really important. Uh, it may be that we can, uh, we can create a multilateral platform for the whole world uh, in one go. But I think the future is gonna be more regional platforms which are then linked up, uh, maybe using different, different technology. Normally, um, uh, it's easier to build things with people uh, who share common problems uh, in, uh, in the regions um, and then to put those things together. So I'm very impressed by what's happening in ASEAN, what's happening in, in Europe and other places. We just have to make sure that, that actually what we don't wind up with is regional systems that can't talk to each other. So as well as kind of looking inwards to our own region, we have to look outwards to say, okay, well, how does this connect uh, elsewhere? And I think actually the G20 and the FSB can play a big role here in that sharing of knowledge and trying to keep us all moving, uh, moving forward together. Thank you, John. That, I think we can wrap up. Once again, this is not a dream. This is not only a vision, but a real vision, concrete vision, which is making the global economy and financial transaction becoming faster, cheaper, as well as transparent, and with well-regulated risk mitigation. Moving from now, corresponding banking, into what Governor Fahad mentioned, digital globalization this is this is the future is year one political will very strong political will Jwin Tenti, together with SPSB starting from Saudi which is starting with the roadmap continuing with a green uh, program last year with Italy now implementation of Indonesia I'm sure our colleagues from India will carry the way with more implementation. Strong political will is here to make the vision, the program come through. Second, this is a very ambitious, ambitious but yet achievable because we already have a destination system. What we will be achieving within the five, six years with the, uh, on the efficiency, connectivity, as well as also regulatory, the infrastructure connectivity, the pricing to be more efficient and regulatory to have on the anti malandering cyber, as well as other payment regulatory. The three keywords already there in the building block of roadmap of cross-border payment with the concrete performance program and also monitoring. Third, regional initiative need to be strengthened and to be connected to the global initiative. In Europe, there are regional initiative in Europe. In Middle East, Governor Fahad, 
also regional initiative. And this next session, ASEAN 5, getting together to show the world the ASEAN payment cross-border connectivity will making even faster than our vision. But that will be a part of international connectivity cross-border payment system. That's the great three kick away. Let's make the dream come true. To recover together, recover stronger. Big applause to our <laughs> distinguished speaker. Thank you once again, Governor Fahad, as well as Mr. John Conley. Thank you, thank you very much, and I will give it back to my master ceremony, please. Thank you very much. Once again, can we give a big round of applause to Governor Perry, Governor Fahad, and Sir John for a very insightful kickstart to today's event. Gentlemen, please remain on your seats as we are going to capture this moment with a photo session. On my marks, give your best smile to the camera. One, two, three. One more time, say cheese. One, two, three. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Once again, you may return to your seats. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, before we move on to the next session, please enjoy the beauty of traditional contemporary dance, Cabaret Baliano, from the talented Eki Dance.
Ladies and gentlemen, can we give a big round of applause to Eki Dance? And for your information, Cabaret Baliano is a greeting dance from Bali, symbolizing our enthusiasm on welcoming the digital era that encourages cross-border payments. In line with a message from Governor Perry during Leaders Talk, international cross-border cooperation needs to be strengthened in light of the increasing economic and financial digitalization. To further give you an illustration regarding cross-border payments initiatives, let's check out the following video. Over the last few decades, payment systems have changed radically. New payment systems have taken shape and more innovations are underway. The COVID-19 pandemic has further accelerated the transition to digital payments. Technological developments have caused not only activities to be increasingly digitized, but also connected, growing the need for faster, cheaper, more transparent and more inclusive cross-border payment systems. Improvements in cross-border payments would make a real difference to overcome the cost of the frictions and shortcomings of the current systems. Thus, faster, cheaper, more transparent and more inclusive cross-border payment services would deliver widespread benefits for the development of the regional economic recovery in the post-pandemic phase, as well as support economic growth, regional trade and financial inclusion. The G20 has made enhancing cross-border payments a priority during the 2020 Saudi Arabian Presidency by mandating FSB and CPMI to develop a global roadmap for enhancing cross-border payments. Indonesia's presidency in 2022 continues the work and sets it as the priority agenda of the G20 finance track. The stage of work in 2022 comprises not only further analysis, but the development of specific proposals for material improvements of underlying systems and arrangements, as well as the development of new systems. Southeast Asian countries have already been one step ahead. Bilateral arrangements made in accordance to cross-border payment initiatives, especially among five Southeast Asian central banks, proved that ASEAN countries had been one step ahead in payments connectivity. Indonesia's QR code interoperability with Thailand and Malaysia aims to increase transaction efficiency, facilitate economic activities, particularly for MSMEs, including the tourism and remittance sectors, as well as promoting local currency settlement. Indonesia's fast payment infrastructure, BI Fast, has been implemented since December 2021. In the next phase, BI Fast will be expanded to be able to process cross-border payment services and is expected to be interlinked with fast payments in other countries as it looks forward to follow the path of interlinkage between PayNow Singapore and Do It Now Malaysia as well as between PayNow Singapore and PromptPay Thailand. The development of Bank Indonesia Real-Time Gross Settlement, BIRTGS, the Indonesian Large Value Payment System, has included multi-currency features, which will be able to facilitate customers transacting foreign currencies on a real-time basis. These various payment interoperability initiatives are supported by local currency settlement, which allows settlement in each local currency, thereby creating efficiency in cross-border transactions, while at the same time contributing to maintaining macroeconomic stability. In line with the G20's mandate to prioritise cross-border development, those synergies are potentially to be enhanced through broadening the interlinkages between infrastructures as well as integrating the existing bilateral agreements into a multilateral collaborative framework and map. Bank Indonesia believes that innovation on cross-border payments will build faster, cheaper and more accessible payment services in the region. 
this initiative will further strengthen the economic ties between countries and serve as a key enabler to support post-pandemic economic growth. To make it happen, collaborative and sustainable initiatives, supported by both the private and public sectors, are expected to provide the necessary improvements and the development of connectivity across Southeast Asian countries. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the G20 has prioritized improving cross-border payments. Enhancing cross-border payments requires addressing frictions in existing cross-border payment processes. The goal is to make cross-border payments faster, cheaper, more transparent, and more accessible to everyone while maintaining safety and security. Improving interoperability between both regional and global cross-border payments is essential. And to dig deeper into that, in the next session, we will see how the five Southeast Asian countries tackle cross-border payment interoperability issues in the regions and where the collaborative work will be directed going forward. We will start the first casual talk with the topic faster, cheaper, transparent, and more inclusive cross-border payment to promote regional economy recovery. And so, without further ado, please welcome our moderator, Assistant Governor, Head of Payment System Policy Department, Bank Indonesia, Ibu Filia Ningsi Hendarta. Thank you, Desen. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, evening for everybody. A warm welcome from Bali to the fourth day of FACD 2022. To all of you, both of you who are here in person or who are joining us virtually. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me I'm Filian Ningse Hendarta. I'm the Assistant Governor of Bank Indonesia. I'm the Head of Payment System Policy Department. And today we, we have a very uh, interesting uh, casual talk. As mentioned before, we will have the interconnectivity uh, in Asia, uh, particularly for the five Asian uh, central banks. And as we know here, uh, we will have the topic of the faster, cheaper, more transparent, more inclusive cross-border payment to promote regional economic recovery. And as we know, cross-border payments are often perceived as the high cost, low speed, limited access, and also lacking in transparency. So, uh, to address this issue, the roadmap for enhancing the cross-border payment was initiative by the Saudi Arabian uh, G20 uh, presidency, which we know, uh, which was also touched upon in our previous session. So this G20 priority initiative asked the FSB and also in coordination with the CPMI to develop a roadmap to address the challenge of the cross-border payment. And here, the Indonesia presidency in 2022 continue the work and has set it as a priority agenda of the G20 finance track. So in this regard, to the international collaboration, Southeast Asia country are already one step ahead. So the payment connectivity has been growing in the recent years through the bilateral agreement between uh, two central banks, and especially among the five Southeast 
Asian central banks. So joining us today, His Excellency Governor of Bank Indonesia, Bapak Perry Wardjo, and His Excellency Managing Director of Monetary Authority of Singapore, Mr. Ravi Menon, Her Excellency Governor of Bank Negara Malaysia, Mrs. Nur Samsia Muhammad Yunus, and also His Excellency Governor of Bank Thailand, Mr. Setaput Sutiwat Nararbut, but unfortunately, due of the health issue, he will be replaced by the governor, the beauty governor of Ronaldo Nunmonda. And we all here, Governor Setaput, wish you a safe, swift recovery. And also, His Excellency Governor of Banco Central Philippines, Mr. Felipe Medala. So, who will share their insight on what has been done? and also what remain to be done in order to improve the cross-border interoperability in the region. All right, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome all five governor and managing director to the hybrid states. <laughs> governor Perry, please uh, kindly join me uh, to the fact this stage. Okay, Honorable Asian Central Bank Governor, we thank you for your time. Please allow me uh, to guide today's discussion. Uh, in discussion, we will, I will cast a few questions to each of all you in the interest in time. So allow me to give each of you three minutes to answer the question. So the first question, Governor, uh, is for all panelists. And as we know, the international collaboration is important. So one example of this is the general understanding for the inter, uh, infrastructure interlinkage. So what collaboration has been done so far regarding the cross-border uh, payment initiative, especially among the five Southeast Asian uh, central banks? So let's first hear from Governor Perry. Thank you, uh, Assistant Governor Philly. Indeed, this is very important. In the first session, we have concluded three aspects. Political will from the top. Second, we need to connectivity globally on the infrastructure, the pricing, and the regulatory. The third regional initiative need to be strengthened and move to global. In ASEAN, we are grateful we have ASEAN financial integration. We have ASEAN payment connectivity framework. So far, we are doing bilateral. On the BI Thailand, BI Malaysia, BI Singapore. Regional initiative need to be strengthened. On the 15th of June last month, we got together. Myself, MD Rafi Menon, Governor Nur Samsia, Governor Stathbut and Governor Benjamin of Diokno back then and now already talking, Governor Philippe. What we need to do to have a regional collective starting with the ASEAN five cross-border connectivity. We start with connecting our retail payment, QR being connected, five. Fast payment being connected and as well as using local currency to bring about efficiency on those cross-border payment. We agree on that. And of course, this is the time. We will work together on the ASEAN 5 to move this into reality. So this will linking later on to the global. With the ASEAN 5 to the global with our collaboration on the ASEAN 5, QR connectivity, fast payment connectivity, local currency. Of course, we need to move forward on other aspects, whether on the regulatory, pricing, and we are thankful. 320 
SVSB roadmap, giving also a reference, guidance on how we move forward from the ASEAN 5 to ASEAN to the global initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Perry. So we hope that uh, today we will have the insight that navigate the, the future of the interconnectivity in the Asian region. So uh, maybe we can move to uh, MD Menon. So please, MD Menon. Oh, okay. So since uh, uh, MD Menon still, still have a meeting, can we just uh, hear from Governor uh, Samshia? Please, uh, Governor. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Governor Perry and Bank Indonesia uh, for inviting me to be part of this panel. So let me start by saying that uh, for a small and highly open economy like Malaysia, uh, having safe and efficient cross-border payment services are critical uh, to support trade and commerce uh, with our neighbours and countries from all over the world. So we are pursuing multiple efforts on many fronts, uh, but I will group them basically into two groups. First, uh, we are linking uh, Do It Now, our fast payment system, with that of our ASEAN neighbors. And this is a no brainer. Uh, within Malaysia, Do It Now has enabled millions of individuals and businesses uh, to transfer money instantly and seamlessly. So imagine if we could do the same uh, for the whole of region. Uh, making cross-border payments cheaper, faster, more transparent, and accessible um, to uh, all 600 million plus of us in the region. So the economic impact can be significant. ASEAN economies are highly integrated, and as intra-ASEAN trade, I think, accounts for the largest share of total trade in ASEAN. So think about how this can bring about a change to how people and business uh, trade and travel. And with over 10 million people in ASEAN living, uh, working, and studying in other countries within the region, uh, integration of fast payment system can transform. Uh, and, and this will transform um, cross-border payment services. So today, we have launched uh, QR payment linkages with uh, Thailand and Indonesia with efforts um, to expand them to support peer-to-peer -peer fund transfers. Uh, similar initiatives are also being pursued uh, with Singapore and the Philippines. Second, we are exploring um, a more multilateral approach to enhance cross-border payments for ASEAN and beyond, uh, with payoffs expected further in the future. So our efforts to set up bilateral connections for fast payment system in ASEAN is important, uh, but we also need to start thinking about how to go about it more efficiently at the regional and global level. So, and that's why we are participating in the uh, Project Nexus Proof of Concept to test the feasibility of establishing a, a more scalable multilateral network of fast payment system. And through Project Dunbar, we have also collaborated with the BRS Innovation Hub and the central bank in Australia, Singapore, and South Africa to test the use of wholesale CBDC for international settlement through a common chat platform. We are also implementing uh, an industry-wide migration to ISO 222 messaging standards. So besides facilitating faster and more seamless cross-border payments, we also hope to see our financial institutions reap the benefits of data-rich payments to improve risk management and offer more value-added services. So there's a lot of exciting things happening in cross-border payments, and um, this will be beneficial for our economies by increasing efficiency and, uh, more importantly, enhancing financial inclusion. Thank you, Governor Samshia. It's very interesting. So we are looking forward to have a more bilateral and multilateral cooperation here. Uh, for the next turn, uh, we have already had uh, MD Ravi on screen. So for the next turn, we would like to hear from MD Ravi. Please, MD Ravi. Thank you, uh, and uh, good morning to everyone. 
thank you also to Governor Perry uh, for the kind invitation to join the uh, uh, second um, Indonesia Digital Economy and Finance Festival. Uh, I'm pleased to be on this panel with uh, my fellow ASEAN Central Bank governors. ASEAN has made very good progress in driving faster and cheaper cross-border payments. Um, one of the most effective ways to achieve cheaper, faster, and more secure payments across borders is through the linking up of national faster payment systems, or FPS. And uh, this is no longer a theory. Uh, the MAS and the Bank of Thailand launched last year the world's first linkage between two faster payment systems across country. The linkage between Singapore's pay now and uh, Thailand's prompt pay allows individuals in Singapore and Thailand to send money to one another using just a mobile number. You don't need to know the person's bank account number. All you need to know is to know the person's mobile number. And using your mobile device, you can transfer money directly from the sender's bank account into the recipient's bank account. It takes just a few minutes. And it is up to five times cheaper than the conventional corresponding banking channels. Um, it costs, uh, the current linkage costs uh, around 3% of the transfer value. Uh, if you do it through the normal corresponding banking channels, it's 10 to 15% of the transfer value. That's what it costs. And so <clears throat> this achieves already at 3% uh, the, the target or the goal that is being set out by the G20 with respect to retail cross-border payments. Uh, the take-up has been robust. Um, for the most recent three months for which we have data, March to May of this year, there were 100,000 transactions, total value of Singapore, th uh, 32 million Singapore dollars. Now, the journey to set this bilateral link between Singapore and Thailand was not an easy one, but it has <clears throat> demonstrated what is possible when you have a vision and determination to address the pain points of cross-border payments, and when you have strong public-private partnership amongst the two central banks, the banking industry on both sides, and the payments operators who's, who are the interface really. Uh, our learnings and experiences from this successful project have helped to spur confidence and effort uh, across the region. And so I think among the ASEAN countries, we are seeing more of such bilateral payment linkages being launched uh, or, or being worked on. And I, I can see more of these uh, uh, coming um, on board in the next couple of years. Uh, the MAS itself, we are expanding our bilateral linkages um, across more important payment corridors um, to provide more accessible payments and also remittance options for individuals as well as for micro, small and medium enterprises uh, who really need this. Uh, and who, will, who are facing most of the pain points. So MAS is currently working on establishing a faster payment system linkages with Malaysia, as uh, Governor Shamsi has just said, uh, and also with India. Uh, and we hope to work, com commence work soon on other linkages between, uh, with uh, Indonesia as well as the Philippines. The next phase is to multilateralize these bi bilateral linkages because these can be quite time consuming. If all the countries of ASEAN come together to build an inclusive network of linked retail payment systems, it will significantly enhance business opportunities and boost trade, e-commerce, tourism spending, and remittances by migrant labor across the region. And the economic payoffs will be substantial. I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you, MD Ravi. So we can say the uh, regional interconnectivity for everybody and every sector. So uh, let's we continue our discussion. Uh, let me invite Governor uh, Philippe. So please, Governor. Uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you, Governor Perry, for inviting me to this uh, conference. As already mentioned, uh, the the Philippines is looking at the experience of initiatives of Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia, where in each country was able to use uh, uh, what, at least one operational cross-border payments linkage, either through a, a fast payment system, it's in the Philippines we call Instapay, or QR connectivity, 
that the Philippines can learn uh, and from, from previous experiences of those who are ahead and learn from them and participate. With the Philippines' long economic ties, long and strong economic ties in ASEAN member states, the BSP focused on its efforts on this region by initiating dialogues with the ASEAN five central banks in the second half of last year. And these dialogues are continuing now. We have signed an uh, enhanced fintech cooperation agreement with the MAS, which kicked off the development of the linkage to the Philippines' InstaPay and Singapore's uh, PayNow. The BSP and the Bank Negara of Malaysia also expressed a mutual clear intention to work on linking our InstaPay and uh, Malaysia's Do It Now. I think you're better in giving names than us. No? Do It Now, right? Uh, Work towards the establishment of these linkages is going, wherein the BSP and uh, famous industry players from the Philippines at early stages of discussions, such as knowledge exchanges, consultative meetings with counterparts from Singapore and Malaysia. And in June this year, we, the ASEAN Five Central Banks, also had a meeting in Singapore, wherein we discussed the ways forward in achieving a multilateral payment linkage, which may be built. As I had conversation with Governor Perry, the dream is that uh, any citizen of an ASEAN country can actually move from one ASEAN country to another, and maybe even a third one in a, in a week, and uh, make payments just using his phone. And, uh, from the experience gained from existing bilateral uh, multilateral linkages, such as the Project Nexus and, uh, and Project Dunbar. So, uh, so all of these are very important to us. Uh, as you know, there are Filipinos all over the world, and of course, uh, all over uh, uh, ASEAN. And clearly, are reducing the cost of payments from from 10% right now, a little bit more than 10%, I think, to 3%, uh, it will be game changing. Not just in terms of improving the welfare of those who are currently making payments, but probably will expand the number of people making payments. I think those are the two important gains. Those already using it will clearly benefit. But as the technology becomes safer, more reliable, and people have more confidence in everything, including uh, making sure that they get very fair exchange rates and transparent uh, in a very transparent process, I am very confident that the linkages among ASEAN countries will become even stronger. So I think the 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 goal is uh, move from bilateral to multilateral. And, and I think that is the dream of every ASEAN member country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor. So let's make the dream come true for everybody. So last but not least, let's hear from the beauty governor of uh, Bank of Thailand, uh, the beauty governor, Ronaldo, please. Good morning to you all. Good morning to all the governors and participants. Thank you, Governor Perry, for inviting the Bank of Thailand to participating in this um, forums. Um, as our governor has alluded to, I think we are really excited in terms of um, the cross-border payment uh, linkage between the ASEAN countries. As our the governor mentioned, this is a set a stage for a, a more in terms of a global real-time um, cross-border payment. As uh, Governor um, Ravi, uh, MD Ravi mentioned, we were very excited that we are the first actually real-time cross-border fund transfer between FASFA and, and PromPaid. And, and uh, we have seen a lot of you know, transactions taking off in the past two, three months. Um, and we also working on with a lot of you know, ASEAN members to continue to be able to make a six more bilateral QR code payment in, in the future. Um, to come. But, but, but I'm alluded to that um, we have been learning the lesson from, from the, the exercise of um, talking to the, the project managers in terms of the cross-border between ASINs. I think the key takeaway from, from what we have done so far is that in order to make this success, you have to have a customer experiences and in terms of the usefulness of the real-time 
fund transfer. Actually, in the speed, uh, normal time in the cross border, it takes at least two or three days. But with this real time payment, the transfer are real, real, real time. So in actually, it's it can be a real time transfer. Uh, the most important second key successful of, of this uh, proof of concept is the cost. The cost has been decreased from 13% of sending, you know, um, in a, a normal tran traditional cross border. Now it's come below only about 2% of even less than that in the amount with using this real time QR payment. Another thing is that the transparencies. Now the customer can be able to see the breakaway of the course. There are you know, fee breakdowns between FX ratio in the confirmation rather than total cost. So this is useful in terms of real time payment. And more importantly, the assessment. Rather than you know done at the physical location, with this real time, it's anywhere at any time to the mobile banking. So I think the key takeaway of this cross-border payment is the proof of concept. The consumer um, has been learning um, what are the benefits of cross-border. Another key takeaway from, from working together with the, the RSNs on, on this exercise that um, in order to make it success, as uh, MD Ravi mentioned, you have to have a commitment among, among the stakeholders. You have to have collaborations and more importantly, uh, the communication. I think that's this other uh, key takeaway. And at least uh, this ASINT payment connectivity that we start since 2018, we will set a stage, as the Governor mentioned, in terms of global uh, or even in terms of more bilateral in the future. So I stop it here. Thank you. Thank you, DG Ronaldo. Uh, definitely, we know the customer experience is very important. Layer by layer, it will create the customer behavior. And this is very important for the uh, interconnectivity. So next question uh, for Governor Perry and also for MD Ravi. Uh, since uh, we have all the Asian Central Bank here, so we want to know the vision what is your vision for the future of the cross-border payment in the Asian region? So let's first hear from Governor Perry. Thank you. Uh, we already hear the five central banks in the region already have a commitment as collaborative, also communication. That today we are communicating. Among five of us already moving from bilateral into regional, the five integrating our infrastructure, also moving more efficient in the regulatory framework. Starting with QR, fast payment, local currency. Just imagine everybody from the five moving, also doing the transaction across the region, real time, very, very fast. This is will improving the welfare of our people, inclusion, as well as SME remittances. Our next step is to move this regional vibe cooperation on the QR, fast payment, local currency. We will be working and then we are aiming at the leaders November this year. Our five leaders will sign of the memorandum of understanding. This is the short vision. But of course, among us also, we will be moving toward more upper uh, cooperation on the global, as John mentioned, from ASEAN 5 to ASEAN Payment Connecting, as well as, as also Governor Nur Samsiah mentioned, linking also to project and global initiative. Next is Dunbar, wherever that will be suitable to our region. Beyond that, of course, we have we also thinking on the real time gross settlement and other payment infrastructure. So I think this is once again we thanks for the G20 FSB roadmap of cross border payment agreement. I think that will be also setting our reference, our vision, and this is will really also moving from ASEAN to the global with the reference of global, but ASEAN moving of the cross-border to the global. I think this is uh, 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 our vision 
and Indonesia, for example. Fast payment since we launched in, uh, in December. Now every day, 700,000 transactions retail with the cost only 2,500 rupiah. I don't know what this in dollar. How many is just uh, probably about uh, 10, uh, 15? When one in thousand is about 10 cents or something like very, very cheap and becoming more popular. QR on this year is 18.7 million users. This year we'll be aiming 30 million, 30 million. Within the next three years, we are aiming all of the SME will be digitalized, 65 million. Just imagine this will also happening across the five region of ASEAN, ASEAN, and be connected to the global. Yes, this is ambition. This is the vision, but us have a strong commitment to be collaborative and also to be com communicative and working also with the private and industry. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. With the power of we, we believe we can do it. And this is the practical uh, contribution from Asia as a first mover. So hopefully it can also enlarge to the global. So uh, thank you again, Governor Perry. Now let's hear the vision from uh, MD Ravi. So uh, MD Ravi, please. Thank you. Um, the vision for ASEAN payments connectivity is uh, basically to achieve cheaper, faster, and more secure cross-border payments for both retail and wholesale payments within the region. Uh, we must also ensure that ASEAN's payments connectivity uh, is done in an interoperable way so that it will allow ASEAN to plug easily into other regional or key payment systems for global connectivity. So connectivity within ASEAN and interoperability to connect outside of ASEAN. I just want to touch on retail payments connectivity in the interest of time, because that's also where the pain points are most keenly felt and the opportunities for improvement are the biggest. For retail cross-border payments within the region, there are two aspects to keep in mind as we forge ahead. One, how to improve cost efficiency. And two, how to ensure inclus inclusivity. So first, cost efficiency. Now, scaling up connectivity on a multilateral basis will help to expedite the linkages with many countries within a short time frame. So earlier on, I spoke about the bilateral linkages, uh, Singapore, Thailand, and now Singapore, Malaysia, and so on. Uh, but this needs to be scalable. Uh, bilateral takes time, uh, and uh, it's not the most efficient way. It's good to demonstrate the technology and uh, frameworks, gain experience, which we are all gaining. Uh, but I think it's very cost efficient to move away from that to a multilateral approach. Uh, the BIS Innovation Hub uh, is currently working on what it calls Project Nexus. Now, this is a model to multilaterally connect the national faster payment systems through a standardized API gateway. It requires minimal changes to their domestic systems. So rather than connect two systems directly, it is to connect to a platform, uh, which is a standardized API gateway. Uh, and you plug into this and you achieve multilateral connectivity. So this allows everyone to seamlessly join the network over time. If some players in ASEAN want to come at a later point, they just have to plug into this platform. Now, this model is being tested. There's a technical pilot to link up the future payment systems, the fast payment systems of uh, Singapore, Malaysia, and the Euro system. So this goes to my point about interoperability. Uh, it needs to be open to the rest of the world. And after this, I think there's very good potential to pursue multilateral payments connectivity of all the fast payment systems in ASEAN based on this model. Uh, second, before I end, inclusivity. This is very important. Our end goal is comprehensive cross-border payments connectivity across all 10 ASEAN countries. So we need to find a way to include those countries who do not have faster payment systems. And they may decide that it is not necessary for them, but we need to include them. So there was an interesting proposal uh, made by the Association of Banks of Cambodia and the ASEAN Bankers Association uh, earlier this year in April. Uh, this was shared with the ASEAN Central Bank governors when we met. 
Um, and the proposal was basically about facilitating linkages between fast payment systems and non-fast payment systems. Now, this involves creating interoperable payments platforms that can connect all the digital financial providers, including non-bank payment providers and digital wallets, which are growing uh, very rapidly across uh, ASEAN. So this will be another game changer if you can uh, find out ways in which you can have, have interoperability between uh, fast payment systems and non-fast payment systems. Uh, the ASEAN central banks have expressed strong interest. They want to embark on a journey to explore the potential of this truly inclusive regional payment strategy, which would be uh, another, the next phase of our vision. Uh, thank you. Thank you, MD Ravi. Oh, this is a very suitable with our topic here. How we can create the cross-border payment, the cheaper, faster, more inclusive, and more transparent. In Indonesia, we have the tagline, Cemumu'a. This is also how we can uh, create, we want to create the payment system for the public, uh, fast, easy, cheaper, and also secure and reliable. So, all right, we have here uh, about the vision. Now we want to move, and now we are curious about what is the key aspect are needed to establish the interoperability of the cross-border payment. So I'm going to turn to Governor Samshia and then Governor Felipe and also DG Ronaldo. Please, let's first hear from Governor Samshia. Please, Governor. Um, so on this question, um, to, to be able to optimally harness uh, the benefits of interoperability, uh, we believe cross-border payment arrangement um, should have the features of one, uh, neutrality, second, parity, and thirdly, uh, inclusivity. First, neutrality. Um, I believe um, that cross-border payment arrangements must be um, technology agnostic to support diverse connectivity and payments model. Uh, for example, uh, when we establish a linkage between our do it now uh, and other national fast payment system, uh, we sought to ensure that the linkages are designed flexibly so that they can support new connectivity models um, such as DLT, uh, which can help realize greater efficiencies. Neutrality is also uh, crucial uh, in any future development of multilateral payment platforms. Uh, we need to have in mind uh, not only the fast payment systems we have today, but also new systems of tomorrow, which could take the form of any uh, possible CBDC systems. Uh, we also need to bear in mind uh, that different countries are in different stages of development, uh, with some countries at what uh, MD Ravi have said, not having fast payment systems at this juncture. Second, parity. Uh, Cross-border payment arrangements should seek to allow fair and open access to all banks and non-bank payment system uh, providers. Uh, this would foster cooperation uh, between players uh, where innovation would flourish through collaboration at the infrastructure level and competition at the product level. So in Malaysia, Do It Now uh, is widely participated by both banks and non-banks, um, subject to the appropriate minimum risk management standards. So this has allowed us to grow the network reach of users and merchants while ensuring that it remains safe and safeguarded against the risks um, such as cyber threats. As a result, we are seeing greater usage among users who value um, not only the expanded network, uh, but also ongoing product innovation. So third, inclusivity. Uh, we need to cater for new use cases and meet the needs of different user groups. Our Do It Now have been designed uh, to facilitate um, scalability to cater for any future expansion and business model changes. Um, this include, among others, um, the ability to support higher transaction limits and new use cases such as B2B remittances. Equally important um, are efforts to address the last mile challenges to ensure all segments of the society are able to benefit from safe and efficient cross-border payments. For example, 
uh, to facilitate migrants who are not able to afford smartphones uh, to send money home. Cross-border remittance services should also support uh, more affordable channels such as feature phones and smart cards. So all of us are trying to build a system or rather a network of systems. And unless we have neutrality, parity and inclusivity, it will be difficult for us to realize the scale and network effects um, that make cross-border payment services accessible and effective. So I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. So this is uh, amazing. Do it now, not yesterday, not tomorrow, but now. So for all of you that has not know about do it, do it in Malay and in Bahasa Indonesia is money. So do it now, not yesterday, not tomorrow. So let's move to Governor uh, Filipe. Please, Governor. Okay, I will not go too much now into technical aspects since they've been uh, adequately discussed. Uh, of course, what we know is each country has its own payment system, which uh, each one with its own uh, idiosyncrasies, uniqueness, with differences in features and operation. So really uh, what we'll solve is, is a, a, a common platform and as they said, uh, where, where it's easy to quote unquote uh, plug in. So I think the other aspect that I have to like to deal on is that the non-technical challenges is coordinating regulatory, supervisory and oversight frameworks, okay? Because this, whoever is involved must be accountable for for all sorts of things like if bad things happen for instance uh, who uh, when 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 is the person with a mobile phone uh, responsible for his losses and when uh, is it the provider and all of those uh, things uh. in addition of course you have the existing requirement like uh, anti money laundering uh, data privacy and uh, so what we want, uh, of course, is that the key risk areas are, are addressed. But again, uh, rather than looking at all the problems we'll encounter, I think our mentality should be, well, to use Tagalog, kaya natin to, we can do it. I think that should be our mentality. And uh, fortunately, ASEAN countries uh, never let problems uh, bag them down. They eventually get down to it and are, are able to, uh, let's say, to use again the, the name of uh, do it, okay? D U I T, okay? So let me stop here. Uh, I, I, I'm actually, instead of thinking all the problems we have to solve, the mentality will be these problems will be solved and get our nations together to, to make this a reality as soon as possible. Thank you, Governor. So it's not only inclusivity is uh, important, but also ga uh, customer protection is also important. So lastly, let's hear from the beauty governor of Ronaldo. Please, uh, DJ Ronaldo. Thank, thank you very much. Yes, I, I do agree with, with the governors um, regarding, you know, uh, we have to do it now and we can do it as, as all um, saying that um, we need commitment we need communication and, and, and collaborations and communications. But, but um, with regarding the cross-border real-time payments, the, the aspect that is got to be even more than domestic uh, cost uh, payment system is that we, we need to have more cooperation interoperability among us uh, since in terms of three aspects, technical, business, and legal. I think it's, it's even more difficult for, for business point of view to have uh, in terms of agreement, what are the pricing model, what are the customer journeys and the common message amongst, um, among the artists cross-border payment. So, so that one of the key aspects that we need to agree on in terms of the focus on the establishment between the business model and business rules that are mutually agreed by involved countries. So first aspect is on business. The second one is probably more difficult. It's on IT and operations. As we are aware that the development between countries in terms of IT and operations infrastructure is different. Uh, we are in a different stage, both in terms of software and hardware. 
and not you know, mention security and networked infrastructure. So there need to be a, a, a working streams on IT and operation to come up with you know, standardized uh, to able to connect among the countries. The third aspect is probably on the legal and, and regulatory, as we all mentioned about privacies, about um, the contractual arrangement, the, the compliance with the law, local law and the global um, um, aspect of like, um, as we have mentioned on privacy on data protections. So with these three aspects, I think the most important thing to make it uh, do it now and can do it in terms of cross-border is to have a governance structure in place. So that's why, um, for example, in faster pay and prompt pay, as uh, MD Ravi mentioned, we need to come in as central bank, play a reading roles in terms of sharing a both in terms of three working groups that I mentioned in terms of business, IT operations and legal to come up with um, kind of negotiation, negotiation and arrangement among the participants. So, so this is something that need commitment among a stakeholder, not only from, from you know, um, central banks, but from all the stakeholder of financial uh, intermediaries and all the payment arrangement. So I think the three aspects that I mentioned need to have a good governance structure, as I mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, DG Ronaldo. Yes, definitely. This We can do it by ourselves. We need the coordination, not only among the authority, but also from the industry, definitely. So uh, if I may go to our last round of question, allow me to give each of you four minutes to answer the question, Governor. So first, I will uh, go to Governor Perry. Governor Perry, are there any uh, macroeconomic uh, feature that need to be supported to ensure the sovereignty in the border, uh, the cross-border payment? Yes, of course. Payment is one aspect of the central banking function. We talk already cross-border payment connectivity agreement on the infrastructure, on the uh, business model, also some of the regulatory supervisory for the payment system. So we can connect to it. But we must, we must not forget payment is one function of the central banking. On the upper end, there should be a governing, governing policy body. which is also talking about harmonization of the policy on the exchange rate arrangement. Because different countries have an exchange rate arrangement. Most of the five already have free foreign exchange system. But still, there is some also market that also we need to on the exchange rate arrangement. So that's why local currency settlement is within the ASEAN 5 connectivity. This is about exchange rate you know, arrangement. About capital flows management, because cross payment will link to the capital's Flows manager, foreign exchange system. And beyond that, about supervisory, regulatory of the financial institution, whether the bank or payment system industry. Those actually other function of the central bank on the monetary policy, as well as on the regulatory and supervisory of the financial institution. We have to talk to, to, to talk that. Once again, this need to go beyond not only payment, but also other function of the central bank. And luckily, there is already a global initiative under G20 or FSB or PIS on this issue of the monetary and financial stability aspect of the payment system. That's why we talk about how regulatory and supervisory framework of the crypto, how the CBDC will be also public, private, you know, a partnership on this. That's why uh, 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 there should be uh, also the CBDC need to strengthen, also reinforce the central bank function of monetary and financial stability. This is this is the asset. We will we will move the what we are thinking in the SN5 beyond this payment. Also, we need to talk about exchange rate arrangement, capital plus management, as well as harmonization of regulatory supervisory of financial institution, both the bank 
and payment system industry. This is the way ahead. Thank you. Wow. As mentioned, a journey of a thousand mile always start with a single step. And this is the single step for the payment system and will follow with yes. the other. And do it now and be fast. Okay. Because Bank Indonesia Fast Management, we call it be fast. Okay. Okay, be fast with do it now. Yeah. Thank you, Governor Perry. Now, uh, let me turn to MD Ravi. Uh, on the several interlinking model in the cross-border payment, in your opinion, which model is the most optimal uh, for the cross-border payment among the five Southeast Asia countries? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I think we need... Uh, several approaches towards uh, achieving uh, payments connectivity uh, because there are different approaches at uh, different circumstances uh, and different use cases surrounding digital infrastructure within ASEAN. So we've talked about QR connectivity. I think that's an important dimension. That is in cases for merchant to, bis uh, merchant to consumer kinds of settings, uh, B2C, and also where it is mostly in person. Uh, then you need uh, a peer-to-peer -peer transfer mechanisms um, for retail and then for wholesale. Now, then underneath the payments connectivity is the settlement connectivity, which is the bank-to-bank the -bank level. So we need different approaches to address different parts of these problems. Um, and so the strategy that we come up with, it needs to be coherent. It needs to bring the various parts together. Now, uh, earlier on, I mentioned a faster or instant payment system. I think for basic person-to-person -person and small and medium enterprise functions, um, the faster payment system connectivity is probably the best approach. It is the most efficient, it is cost-effective, and it will benefit a large number of people directly, migrant workers, small and medium enterprises, and so on. Uh, and it will address many of the existing pain points that they have. And in terms of uh, speed, cost, transparency, and security, we can achieve the most substantial improvements. So the, uh, what I mentioned earlier, the BIS Innovation Hub's Project Nexus model, it offers a multilateral platform that can help to expedite instant retail payments connectivity. Um, then I think you need to also explore settlements connectivity, which can be only achieved if you link up RTGS systems which is, I think, a, a much more complex exercise. Or you can have multi-CBDC platforms where central bank wholesale CBDCs can help to achieve the same outcome of instantaneous or near instantaneous set cross-border settlement. Because there's another chunk of cost that is associated with settlement. So take the lower hanging fruits first, solve the direct payments connectivity problem, which is really about messaging and clearing, uh, which can be done through Project Nexus kind of approach. And then the settlement, which requires a deeper experiment and a more ef greater effort, uh, probably using multi-CBDC platforms, like the one that the BIS Innovation Hub is working on. And at the Singapore Center is Project Dunbar, which uh, a couple of the ASEAN countries are involved in. So I think we need several approaches. Now, one of the key issues we need to address is also what do we harmonize and what do we allow for country-specific policies? So in Project Nexus, it will be a very good test case when the five ASEAN countries come together to do their payments connectivity through this multilateral platform. Now, when it comes to payments processing, governance and procedures and technologies, uh, basic checks for addressing money laundering, terrorist financing risk, we will need largely common rules, standards and approaches. And I think this can be achieved because most of our approaches are converging. Now, at the same time, when it comes to macroeconomic policies, and Governor Perry touched on this, those are very country specific and they're very important to each country. So you need a mechanism that allows for harmonization of processes, payments related issues, but at the same time, ensure that policies on capital flow management, data exchange and data privacy they can continue to be applied in a seamless and efficient manner, where you allow for the differences, 
but they must be able to be applied in a seamless, efficient manner within the cross-border payments platform. Now, if we can do this successfully, uh, this will be a game changer, as I said earlier on. ASEAN will not only strengthen its regional integration and connectivity, but we would be leading the way globally on payments innovation. And what better time to do this than when Indonesia is uh, in and the G20 presidency? This can be a deeply impactful move uh, that we can build for the rest of the world. A public good infrastructure, which improves financial inclusion, enhances efficiency, and creates new business opportunities for all our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, MD. No one size fit all, but we are in Asian will find the fit size for everybody. So uh, let's move to uh, Governor Samshia. Uh, what are the challenges uh, to apply and implement the recent initiative of the uh, cross-border payment? Please, Governor. Um, payments are all about networks and systems. Uh, many players and parts are involved. So when it comes to cross-border payment initiatives, uh, you can expect the challenges to be amplified. Some of the key challenges that come to mind are, um, one, obtaining strong commitment from all parties to ensure the projects are delivered in a smooth and timely manner. Um, two, uh, like what Ravi has said, ensuring the long-term viability of all the cross-border payment infrastructure. And three, uh, identifying an appropriate governance and risk management framework uh, given the cross-border nature of the payment infrastructure and um, its likely systemic importance for the countries um, individually and as a group. So we are still learning and uh, we have no silver bullet solutions. But in my mind, um, there are perhaps two principles that could help us work through these challenges. First, um, we need to establish a clear value proposition um, to all stakeholders involved. We are talking about network, networks and systems, so the economies have to make sense um, to key stakeholders. Uh, initiatives uh, must be able to demonstrate clear value propositions and strong benefits, and not only to the end users, uh, but also to the payment system operators and participating financial institutions. Um, for this, uh, we find that actively engaging the industry early um, to establish an appropriate business model is key. Um, this can help inform and shape the prioritization of initiatives and ensuring a win-win outcome for all players. Um, this would include identifying relevant corridors to prioritize based on trade, tourism, and remittance flows. It is also important um, to work on a fee structure that balances the need of all stakeholders. Um, additionally, um, extending the implementation of local currency settlement framework can help facilitate more cost-efficient settlement arrangement between countries. So if the economics make sense, then the initiative will be sustainable over the long run where players innovate and compete uh, on their own violation. Second, um, strong public-private sector partnerships. And you know, um, some of my colleagues here have also uh, stressed the same points. Um, ideally, the industry should drive uh, cross-border payment initiatives. Uh, but the reality is that as we are trying to build and expand networks across economies, the complexity of the task means that central banks must play an important role. Um, this includes setting the overall tone and vision, opening doors, um, setting the tempo, fostering collaboration, ironing out differences, and resolving issues among the different stakeholders. So this is why we need close and regular engagements between the pri private and public sector players. So for us in Bandungara, Malaysia, uh, we have found the setting up of project steering committees uh, in each cross-border payment initiative that we are participating in as being useful uh, in fostering a strategic alignment and ensuring timely resolution of issues um, to drive the project forward. Such arrangements also provide an avenue um, to ensure that the initiatives are underpinned by an appropriate governance and risk management framework that adequately manage risk in both jurisdictions. 
So a key success factor for this is to ensure that these committees have sufficiently diverse uh, stakeholder representation and also a fair and equitable uh, decision-making process. Thank you, Governor. Uh, definitely, we agreed that the uh, partnership of the private and public is needed to support the cross-border payment. Moving on, let me ask uh, Governor Felipe, uh, what are the region's strengths and opportunity that can be leveraged to enhance the cross-border payment? Uh, please, Governor. Of course, the most important strength is that uh, people to people uh, connections in ASEAN are growing very fast. And uh, of course, the trade uh, among ASEAN countries is also growing, growing very fast. Now, on the Philippine side, uh, the, the economic relationship uh, that we have with ASEAN member states and uh, Together with regional initiatives such as the ASEAN Payments Policy Procurement, could be a good starting point to, to encourage uh, 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 the countries to devote resources. For instance, I, I find very interesting the experience of Indonesia where the limited, many islands and then there are actually a lot of uh, islands that don't have access to cell phones signals. And uh, I, I, I think a uh, system of uh, maybe the public investment in satellites will, will solve the problem. Now, the great importance is that, as shown by the pandemic, there was rapid growth in, uh, well, to back off, uh, when we were just computing financial inclusion based on people having bank accounts, it was a very stagnant statistic. Uh, as I used to joke, it's like uh, watching your hair grow. Uh, you look at the mirror, it's exactly the same. Now with the, with the introduction of e-money and phone-based uh, 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 banking and, ca and uh, e-money services, there's an explosion of uh, the number of people who are now using it. Now, of course, one can even uh, imagine cases where a person has no cell phone, but uh, he knows the store owner, what we call sari-sari store owners, who has a cell phone. So what you do is you send the money to the person with the cell phone. So the, the little store owner actually uh, became uh, almost like a little uh, money money changer. So I think the potentials are great. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, government should look at uh, public investments to, to make access to all these things almost universal. And uh, in an uh, island economy, that's why, as I said, I always look at Indonesia, uh, that that's a little bit harder, and maybe the, the solution is investment in, in more satellite communications. So I think uh, uh, as, as ASEAN has a lot to gain, uh, and of course in, in, the, in the Philippines where a lot of people are receiving remittances, even if they cannot send, uh, to, uh, the important thing to them is they can receive. So it, that alone is, a, is already such a great movement forward for, for, for helping people. So in, in summary, uh, when, when I look at the potential benefits that, and how, how, how far-reaching the benefits can be, really uh, there's no reason why government commitment to work with the private sector to make it succeed, uh, such as Again, following from multi, uh, the experience already in so-called uh, Nexus and Dunbar, we, that, that we're able to uh, maximize the, and speed up the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the access to the services. Thank you, Thank Governor. You. Thank you, Governor. So we are agreed that the commitment is very important to make our dream come true. So I still have a one last question for today. So to complete this round, let's turn to DG Ronaldo. Uh, what are the best practices of the collaboration between authorities, association, 
and player for enhancing the cross-border payment. Please, DG Ronaldo. Thank you, Hedentra. Um, yes, as our governor has alluded to, I think um, in terms of the ASEAN Payment Connectivity Initiative, I think the, the key aspects of, you know, make it implementation and execution to take it off, as all mentioned, is a commitment. It's not only commitment among the private sector, but it had to be a commitment among the stakeholders, including central banks. And there need to be a, a concrete plan to get, you know, the direction right. The common commitment has to be driven in various forms. For example, the private sector need to have a sector driven, but the customer centric, we need to get it emphasized. That is the role of such central bank to playing the voice of people to ensure that the customer need are at the center of the linkage. I think that um, one of the aspects that we have to make it um, firm that you know, the customer are the one who are going to be able to get the benefit from this cross-border linkage, um, as I mentioned, in terms of the speed, in terms of the cost, in terms of the pricings, and in terms of transparencies. Um, and as we all illustrated that the collaboration among stakeholders are the key success factor. As we all knew, as I mentioned, you know, we are in a different stage of IT infrastructure. We are in a different stage in terms of um, the, the business model. So in terms of having a working streams and working and cooperation and make a sure, ensure that there, there are cross communication among us are the key aspect of, to understand the different among the stakeholders. So, so this exercise of ASEAN uh, real-time uh, payment system is set a stage, I think, and a lesson learned for, for other countries, other members to expand enhancing into a more scalable and in terms of other uh, within intra-regional. But another thing that I like to add it on is that in terms of emerging market, especially, I think another key element for consumer is that in terms of the level of digital uh, literacies, I think that another key important. Once this real-time settlement, uh, real-time payment is scalable, I think there need to be um, educated uh, the customer, especially the stakeholder who are need to be known to know the risks of the real-time um, settlement what are the risks, what are the benefits? Because there are um, not only on the IT, on security, on stability of the systems, but as we know, that, um, the, the uh, easy way of going into the real-time payment, um, there are also challenges. There's a fraud that, that might occur with the transaction and we need to educate it, the stakeholder on, on this regard. But with regarding the solutions, for, for the real-time payment, whether it's bilateral or multilateral, I think the key success factor, as I mentioned, is on the governance structure that we need to look at uh, carefully what are the structure of that because, as I said, you know, there are difference among jurisdictions, among the uh, development stage of, of IT in terms of the legal and in terms of um, other aspects as well. So the, the key takeaway from this you need to have a guidance, good guidance principles in terms of governance structures, in terms of clear benefit to consumers and engagement among the stakeholders. And as, I, as our governor had mentioned, you have to uh, engage all participants, not only banks, but all the uh, payment provider, including non-bank as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, DG. This is the homework of all of us, not only for the central banker, or for the governor. So, well, we have heard the insight from our distinguished uh, panelists, how the cross-border interconnectivity and coordination in the region will be navigated in the future. So, once again, uh, I would like to thank to the five Asian Central Bank governor and MD, and also DG for their strategic uh, foresight on the cross-border payment. And allow me to invite all of you to join me to give applause to the, our distinguished panelists.
And before I close the session, let me invite Governor Perry to conclude the key takes away. Please, Governor Perry. Thank you, IT Billy. Once again, uh, let me once again thank you for our fellows as and five central bank. Governor Nur Samsia, very thank you very much. Terima kasih. MD Rafi Menon, very thank you. Governor Philippe, as well as Governor Support and DG Rodan, Rona, Ronadal. What we learned today? Five of us committed to move forward from bilateral into collective move. For moving faster, cheaper, cross-border payment within this ASEAN five. We starting with QR, fast payment, local currency, but we also envisioning to move toward real-time cross-settlement, building CBDC, as well as all the technical choices regulatory. As well as we also talking about macroeconomic and monetary financial sustainability aspect of this cross-border. This number one. Thank you all of the commitment of the five. Number two, from the ASEAN to the global. We're not interlinking the ASEAN five, but also with ASEAN. But as MD Rafi, Governor Nur Samsia mentioned, we are linking also to the global initiative, BIS, Project of Nexus, Dunbar, as well as also regulatory aspect of the FSB on aspect of CBDC, crypto, and other aspect of the payment system. Also committing also to the roadmap of cross-border payment coordination group. ASEAN will be also a leading example of how from bilateral to regional to the multilateral, from the ASEAN to the global. Third, all of this initiative we saw for the benefit for our people, for the benefit of our country, and for the benefit of our industry, for making economic and financial inclusion, remittances, SME, transfer, tourism, as well as also international and trade collaboration and cooperation. ASEAN economic integration, ASEAN financial integration, and also working with the industry, educating people, literacy of this aspect. From the Central Bank of ASEAN 5, to the global, to the people, to the country, to the industry. With that, thanks you once again, Governor Nur Samsia, MD Rafi, Governor Felipe, and my DG Ronaldo. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor Perry. It was said that life is like riding a bicycle. So to keep our balance, we have to keep moving. So let's keep moving together to recover together, to recover stronger. Stay safe and keep healthy. Thank you, thank you for Bali. All right, thank you very much, Ibu Fili and the five Asian Central Bank Governors and Managing Director for the very fruitful discussion. And we kindly request for you to stay on your seats on this hybrid trade for a photo session. On my marks, ladies and gentlemen, to the camera, give your warmest smile. One, two, three. One more time. One, two, three. Thank you, Ibu Fili and Governor Perry. You may return to your seats. Can we give another big round of applause for Ibu Fili for moderating this session? Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, for the next agenda, we would like to hear some insights from the point of view of industry representatives. And so let me introduce to you Mr. Paul Gui, 
Secretary General of Asian Bankers Association, who joins us online to give some insights. Mr. Paul, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you uh, for uh, you know uh, you know this this morning and uh, first and foremost um, distinguished uh, governors, excellencies, uh, chairmen, uh, fellow speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. And uh, first and foremost, uh, I would like to express my deepest appreciation to the Bank of Indonesia and Governor uh, Perry the organizer for inviting us to participate in this year's Indonesia in the Digital Economy and Finance Festival 2022. With the theme of advancing digital economy and finance, synergistic and inclusive ecosystem for the accelerated recovery. This is indeed a timely and appropriate theme for us in this region. Now, please allow me to add uh, the response, the comments made earlier by our five ASEAN Central Bank governors about faster, cheaper, more transparent, and more inclusive cross-border payment to promote regional economic recovery. Firstly, as the National Bank Association in ASEAN, we are indeed very grateful to the foresight and game-changing initiatives of our ASEAN Central Bank governors in the area of cross-border payment under the ASEAN Payment Connectivity Initiative launched in 2019, which also closely aligned with the efforts of the G20 and Financial Stability Board to facilitate faster cheaper and more inclusive and more transparent cross-border arrangement. As an example, through this initiative, our central bank governors and close collaboration with our national banking association, the Association of Banks in Singapore, ABS, and the Thai Banker Association, TBA, through working with the respective central banks have launched the world's first cross-border retail real-time payment to linking their domestic payment system, which we have heard from the governors Singapore Pay Now and the Thailand Prom Pay in 2021. I would like to pause here to express my heartiest congratulations to Bank of Thailand and the Monetary Authority of Singapore for being jointly awarded the Initiative of the Year for 2022 by the Central Banking Journal for this world first real time cross border transfer service. This has been well received by our retail customers and small businesses in both countries as it provides convenient, fast, and safe cross-border money transfer at a fraction of the usual cost. At the same time, we also note that this will support the push for greater usage of local currency settlement framework, LCS, which allows settlement in local currency. And this has helped to mitigate the attendant effects and settlement risk as well as brief lower costs. We have heard earlier from our governors that this has reduced from 10 to 15 percent to 2 to 3 percent. So that is quite significant. With such cost benefit, the transaction usage has been growing and well and trending upwards. As an indicator, the leaks, the transaction leaks for both uh, the transaction has been over 100,000 with a high corresponding value of over 100 million. 
What does this mean? This means that the members of the general public and the migrant workers are reaping from the benefits of this linkage, despite travel restrictions imposed by due to COVID-19. This augurs well with ASEAN's drive for faster, cheaper, and more transparent and more inclusive cross-border payment to promote regional economic recovery. I'm delighted and encouraged to note more of such bilateral cross-border payment connections are being made across ASEAN 5. Case in point, as was mentioned earlier, that there will be interlink of BFAS or BIFAS, instant rail retail payments with the other ASEAN member states. This will only further enhance and expedite the inclusive and regional recovery in ASEAN. As a next step, and to embrace even greater inclusive growth and sustain regional recovery, ASEAN Bankers Association with our national banking associations in ASEAN have further embarked in studying the options available to move to the ASEAN multilateral interoperability or connectivity, including leveraging on Project Nexus and others. A concept that was endorsed by the ASEAN Central Bank Governance Meeting in April 2022. Let me conclude to say that all these are exciting and promising developments, and I believe will further spur greater innovation in the domestic and cross-border payment space for advancing our digital economy and financial sectors in ASEAN and beyond. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Paul Gui, for your view regarding the cross-border payment to promote regional economics. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite virtually Mr. Santo Solim, Chairman of Indonesian Payment System Association, to give his view. Mr. Santo Sol, the virtual stage is yours. Your Excellency, Governor of Bank Indonesia, Mr. Ferry Warjio, Governor of Bank Negara Malaysia, Mr. Nor Samsia Moh Yunus, Governor of the Banco Central Filipinas, Mr. Felipe Mirala, Governor of Bank of Thailand, Mr. Setaput Sutiwar Naruput, Managing Director Monetary Authority of Singapore, Mr. Rafi Minon, and our distinguished speaker and guest. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. May peace be upon us. Shalom, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. On behalf of Indonesia Payment Association, or ASPI, Allow me to express our appreciation for the opportunity to share industry view in this precious event, FACTI 2022. Indonesia is among the country to prioritize recovery in tourism sector, given its significant contribution to national income and livelihood. Tourism sector provides employment for millions of the workers in Indonesia. With a rapid and widespread vaccination rollout, followed by a major lifting of travel restriction and travel protocol, Indonesia is preparing for effective recovery in tourism in 2022 and beyond. One of the strategic initiatives to support tourism sector is through the digitalization of payment. Fast and reliable payment infrastructure is the key. 
factor to increase tourist spending. With the initiative from Bank Indonesia, supported by ASP and stakeholder in payment industry, QR Indonesia standard we call CRIS has been implemented and widely adopted. Interoperability, interconnectivity, and integration offered by CRIS become key advantage as one CRIS can be accepted by all merchants. CRIS capability has been expanded with the QR cross border. QR cross border has been implemented with the Thailand piloting with the Malaysia and will be followed with other countries such as Singapore, Korea, and, and many more. We truly appreciate to the effort and collaboration from partner countries and we look forward to having other collaboration, particularly with the Southeast Asia countries to expand cross-border payment for stronger economic recovery. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Mr. Santoso, for your view. And ladies and gentlemen, for the next Industries View, I would like to virtually invite Mr. Arshad Rashid, Chairman of Indonesian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Mr. Arshad. The virtual stage is yours. Your Excellencies, Bapak Perry, Borgio, my senior, our Governor of Bank of Indonesia, Excellency Mr. Noor Samsia Muhammad Yunus, Governor of Bank Negara Malaysia, Excellency Mr. Felipe Medala, Governor of Central Bank of Philippines, Excellency Mr. Setaput Suti Wartna Rawaiput, Governor of Bank of Thailand, and Excellency Mr. Rafi Menon, Managing Director, Monetary Authority of Singapore. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. The exchange of currencies are now faster than ever. We have moved from the time of telegraphic transfer which take days for currency settlement to an array of faster digital mediums which now can be settled in hours or even minutes. Post-pandemic recovery requires collaboration and international efforts from regulators and financial institutions to help the business community access wider market in the most affordable way possible. Local Currency Settlement, or LCS, embraced by Malaysia, Thailand, Japan, and China, have allowed the business community to not heavily rely on major global currency such as US dollars and euros. LCS allows businesses from partnering countries to use local currency or currency of the recipients which makes the process of cross-border payment more efficient as it provides a natural hedge for businesses to protect against currency risk exposure, reduces transaction costs through more efficient direct rates, and facilitates faster transfers. We have seen how LC has, has boosted bilateral trade. For example, our trade with Japan has increased tenfold from 2020 to 2021 from one from 9.8 million dollars per month to over 100 million dollars on a month-to-month -month basis it is more rational for countries to trade with local currency as the heavy reliance on major global currency would erode their cash value by the process of multiple conversion and also bank fees cutting as the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, as the voice of the Indonesian business community, welcome the initiative for a faster and cheaper cross-border payment system and would help socialize the use of it for businesses in a wider range of industries. Reliable and affordable 
cross-border transaction would help boost international trade while affording greater convenience for businesses who often transfer money abroad. Lastly, I hope this forum on the cross-border payment framework could include more countries and currencies in adopting the LCS framework as it will benefit the business community, especially those who are in the export and import sectors. Thank you very much and stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you very much, Mr. Arshad, for your view regarding the cross-border payment to promote regional economic. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, before we begin our last casual talk for today, we invite you to enjoy a short intermezzo, a music performance by Big Band Institut Seni Indonesia dan Pasar. Jangan lupa lor 
and gentlemen, can we give a big round of applause for Big Band Institute Seni Indonesia dan Pasar? What a stunning performance! And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is time to continue our agenda with a second casual talk with the topic Enhancing Cross Border Payment Paving the Way Toward Interoperable Payment. This session will be moderated by the Division Chief in the Monetary and Capital Markets Department, International Monetary Fund. And so, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to our moderator, Mr. Tommaso Mancini Grifoli. A very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you very much for attending and thank you again to our wonderful organizers, the Bank of Indonesia, for this event. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and to moderate this panel on cross-border payments. And I'd like to invite up on stage my friends uh, Andrew and uh, Vasu. Please join me on stage. Vasu is the uh, head of payments at the Reserve Bank of India and uh, co-chair of two important reports uh, from the CPMI on cross-border payments. One is on linking payment systems and the other on APIs. And Andrew is, of course, head of the BIS Innovation Hub Center in Singapore. Very warm welcome to you and thanks for joining me here for this panel. So, uh, we have just um, lived through an important, perhaps historic moment uh, a few hours ago here on this stage. You heard the governors of five ASEAN countries commit to linking their payment systems, to linking uh, their fast payment systems. And this is a lot of what this panel will be about. So, what we're going to try to do on this panel is unpack that important announcement that you just witnessed understand what it means and understand what uh, will have to be implemented by central banks to accomplish this vision. And uh, the CPMI has worked very hard uh, with its members, with international organizations, to lay out a conceptual vision for linking payment systems. And we're very fortunate to have Vasu, who has uh, co-chaired the report. But of course, linking payment systems cannot just happen in a void. You, payment systems need to be able to speak to each other, uh, and that is done through APIs. And uh, Vasu also chaired uh, this important report on APIs and will speak to us a little bit about this. And then what we're gonna do is transition to hear from Andrew about a specific use case, an example. Uh, Vasu will have laid out the conceptual foundations, but uh, Andrew is going to speak about Project Nexus. Project Nexus has uh, been one of the important projects of the BIS Innovation Hub that tries to test out the linkage of payment systems on a multilateral basis. Then we'll go back to Vasu, and having heard about the multilateral linkages, we'll hear about bilateral linkages between um, uh, India and Singapore. And then we'll take uh, some uh, further questions between us. If we have time, uh, dear members of the audience, we'll hear some questions from you at the end. We only have 45 minutes to cover a lot of territory, so we'll see if we get there. So first of all, Vasu, over to you. If you could give us a little bit of an overview coming from your reports on uh, how to link payment systems and to leverage APIs. Uh, thank you, Tomaso. Thank you, Andrew, for making me part of the panel. First of all, my hearty congratulations to Bank Indonesia for wonderful hospitality, and also for actually asking or requesting CPMI that you come out with a report on interlinking cross-border payments as part of the G20 presidency. So we are very thankful to the uh, Bank Indonesia for as part of the presidency to direct us and to get this report out of us. 
as uh, the chair of the CPMI, John, Sir John, was mentioning about the various building blocks that were part of the cross-border payment arrangements, and I do happen to co-chair the messaging part of the uh, cross-border payments. And as part of this, and the BB13, I don't want to go very technical into this, but the building block 13, that's on interlinking of cross-border payments, came together and brought out this report. Of course, this report also draws a lot from the stock takes or surveys that the CPMI had with a number of countries which have put in place uh, fast payment systems, which have also have the real-time gross settlement systems. Incidentally, the, the uh, interlinking uh, stock take covered around 82 jurisdictions having around 289 systems, and the API stock take also covered around fast payment systems in around 55 response, responses we got. And what we see is that there are multiple arrangements already happening in, in, in almost 10% of the payment systems, what we say in around 26 uh, systems, the interlinkages are already happening, and typically on a bilateral level. And when we do a bilateral interlinkage, there are benefits available, but unless you make it interoperable, and unless you have some standards like, say, ISO 2022 or the APIs, it's very difficult to establish these linkages. And it's, it's very important to understand that when we talk about linkages, we talk about interoperability, because we don't want a person or a participant who has been onboarded on one system to be onboarded on another system again. So when we do the interoperability, it's like one person gets onboarded on, on both the systems, and that makes the entire system so very easy. And we actually come out of all the ills of the traditional correspondent banking arrangement, typically in terms of the longer chains that are there in the traditional correspondent banking chain can be easily avoided. We have number of hops that are smaller, that is smaller, so we have easier transactions, lower funding costs. Of course, this will all lead to improved efficiency, and the data also gets to be used much more rationally. And in the process, there's increased or enhanced computation to all the participants. But that is the advantage of interlinking, that's the advantage of interoperability. And one of the uh, key points of the report is about how to use the APIs for this. Now, typically, when we talk about APIs, it's not at all technical. Application programming interfaces, me and Andrew are saying hello to each other. He responds, he responds, that's all about API. We don't talk much, we don't talk more. It's just one response that I send, and I, I, uh, one request that I send, and a response that I get. That's how an API gets constructed. And between two systems, it becomes much more easier because each of the systems know what to expect from the other system and how to respond to that request. We don't want the technicians to become uncomfortable when the two systems interact in open-ended fashion. So that's the advantage of APIs. And when we talk about APIs, because these systems in different countries have been brought up in different parts of time, they may adopt certain practices that may not be harmonized. So like in the ISO 2022, we are talking about financial messaging standards that need to be harmonized. Each one, each country may also adopt these practices in a different way, customized or tailored to meet their requirements. So harmonization helps these customizations to be brought as minimal as possible so that the interface and the exchange happens more conveniently as possible. So this report of ours also mentions about what are all the key things that each country needs to look at, whether it's in a bilateral mode or in a multilateral mode, or even in a manner which Project Nexus talks about in a common platform mode, what are the things that need to be taken care of, and what are the key issues and questions that each of the policymakers, the payment system operators, the participants need to ask before they implement such of these systems, such of these practices. And as the earlier discussions were mentioning, there is nothing as exciting as connecting fast payment systems. There is visibility, there is benefit, and there is a social economic impact of that. So that's how I feel we should start. And of course, one thing will lead to another, just like it was mentioned. You link the fast payment systems, you link other payment systems with the fast payment systems, then you go to linking RTGS systems, so the multiple fashions are there. Of course, I feel that the linkages can have major like use cases, like for example, the QR code could be the basis for linking the person to merchant payments in two countries, and the fast payment systems can help in linking the person to person payments in, in these countries. And maybe when I get a chance, I'll also mention about what the good use cases could be for these person to person payments, etc. Why we should have a buy in from the uh, political bosses, from the central bank governors, and from everyone. What are the reasons which we should give them so that they say, yes, please go ahead. 
So once a top-down approach is there, I feel anything can be done. I do understand about the tie-up between Singapore and Thailand, the Penau and Prompe. It, it did take a couple of years, two to three years to settle down, but now probably learning from those experiences and what Project Nexus is offering on table, we could make this these linkages happen much more quickly. So that's all, the re that's all uh, that some of these things that the report contains. I'll be very happy if everybody gets a chance to read the report. I'll stop now and then hand it back over to you, Tomaso. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vasu, for that overview of uh, what is possible. Um, the report is, of course, a discussion, it's conceptual, but in Singapore, we have an actual tangible test. And we've heard a lot this morning about bilateral links between countries. Bilateral is great. Multilateral is even better, and that is what Nexus is about. So, um, Andrew, say I'm living in Bali, and in, as a matter of fact, I, I may one day, I, I've fallen in love with this beautiful island. Say I live in Bali, and, <laughs> and you, you still live in Singapore, um, and I want to make a payment to you. How would that work, and how would Nexus help me do that? Thanks, Tomas. So, um, and, and first, let me say thank you to uh, Bank Indonesia uh, for the warm hospitality over the past few days. Uh, and it's an honor to be here, of course, to share the stage with, uh, with you fine gentlemen. Um, well, my preferred way to pay you in Bali would probably just be to come here, you know, but, you know, that's, a, that's option number one, I guess. But option number two would be, of course, to uh, figure out a way to interlink a, a, a payment system. And, and that's, that's kind of uh, the genesis and the excitement that was discussed this morning, potentially in the, in the ASEAN region as part of a broader strategy. Um, before I maybe go into a deep dive on, or at least a dive into Nexus, um, maybe a step back and talk about what the role of the Innovation Hub is in context of the CPMI, um, as mentioned by Vasu and, and previously by Sir uh, John Cunliffe. Um, I think the CPMI, the FSB, and the G20 really provide a lot of insight into the what and the why we need to um, you know, think about these opportunities, uh, whereas the Innovation Hub's role is really more to explore the how. Our, our capabilities are to sort of roll up our sleeves, uh, get our hands dirty, and try to provide tangible, measurable ways to implement some of the concepts coming out of kind of the more senior uh, bodies that are you know, in, in this space. And so that, that's really the, the role that we embrace. Um, and and you know, we do work across a number of themes. Obviously, central bank digital currency is, is a very hot topic, and we're very active there. But I uh, personally have been a big proponent of you know, what we can do with, with fast payment inf infrastructures. And, and um, my, my view is if we look at this evolution on a timeline, you know, from zero to five to 10 to 15 years, we, we now have a critical mass of instant payment systems having a real impact domestically. India, Singapore, Indonesia last year, Australia, Brazil, there's so many more. And, and so there's a critical mass. And, and that critical mass now, with that critical mass in place, we have an opportunity to, to you know, to, to here and now to make this dream real, which was also uh, used this morning as a as a catchphrase. And um, not to say that central bank digital currencies might not come in in the five to ten to fifteen year timeline, and, and I do think that will happen. But I think there's there's a near term opportunity and there's a medium and a long term opportunity. And also remember that infrastructure investments last a long time. So when you pave a road, typically you know, it's around for a very long time, and that's what we're effectively doing here with, with you know, fast payment infrastructures and eventually with central bank digital currencies. So, you know, with instant payment systems being uh, the kind of backbone of the future digital economy in the near and medium future, to say the least, um, the, the bilateral linkages that we've started to see emerge have, have been tremendously important because they prove that it's actually feasible. We, we recognize and acknowledge it's extremely difficult but it is feasible to connect the infrastructure and to facilitate these cross-border, you know, near real-time transactions. So that's an important step one and something that was really the inspiration for Project Nexus. Um, but as a, also has been mentioned earlier, you know, payments are a network business. Payments rely on network effects and hence we need a, a vision that allows for that to occur. Uh, and so this concept of a multilateral linkage um, emerged and, and is something that we've been working on for the past few years. Um, so Nexus is our kind of best foot forward from the Innovation Hub's perspective 
in that in developing that vision and trying to provide a bit of a, a practical roadmap as to how uh, this could be accomplished. Um, it's an iterative process. The, the first iteration, we actually worked with NPCI in India uh, last year, 2020, 2021, um, to kind of evolve the initial thinking. And then in the past year, we've been working with the ECB, Banca d'Italia, and TIPS, as well as uh, BNM in Malaysia, Paynet, Singapore, um, BCS Nets, and, and the Monetary Authority of Singapore. So a uh, really strong group of, of public sector uh, and private sector partners, as well as consulting very extensively with um, certainly the commercial banking industry and, uh, and a lot of players in, in sort of the financial FX exchange and, and liquidity uh, um, areas. Um, Nexus is essentially developing what we describe as an end-to-end -end protocol, a blueprint for exactly how um, messages can be conveyed, uh, the roles and responsibilities of the participants, including the PSPs and banks, including the FX providers and liquidity providers. Um, it's API-based. It is also message-based in the, an ISO 20022 message-based in particular, in that most systems are still message-based today. So they use APIs for certain aspects, like uh, looking up an identity and resolving a bank account, or requesting more information about the sender or receiver to do sanction screening, and that's all API-based. But the actual payment execution is still message based and that and that will probably remain so because that's how these fast payment systems actually actually work from the payment initiation side of things. But it's important to have that ISO message standard taxonomy over overriding all of this and, and, and that's very much uh, the Nexus model as well. Um, we're also gonna be proposing a kind of a, a first look at a, a proposed scheme rule set and a governance model that might you know facilitate regional and eventually global uh, coordination as well. Um, again, this is an iterative process, so the project in the second phase will be coming up with this technical blueprint, a proposal for a scheme and a governance framework, um, and then of course a working uh, piece of software that embodies the entire uh, package, and, and, and that's a, like a reference implementation of what, what this, uh, this cross-border system can actually do. Um, so, so that's the kind of the, the, the high level vision. I know I did use a lot of jargon. I'm sorry we were trying to eliminate the payment jargon, but it's, it's extremely difficult to do that when you're trying to describe this. Um, I, you know, I just want to maybe end with saying, it, you know, like with, in context of the discussions that have been and the, and the announcements from this morning, um, you know, this is a big mountain to climb. We're very excited to be helping and supporting uh, the initiative. Uh, we're very aware of the challenges, and, and, and I think that having the opportunity to help shape, um, you know, shape the future uh, in this region and, and potentially beyond is, is tremendously exciting. Certainly provides some job security, hopefully, for myself and uh, my colleagues, and we look forward to the journey. Thanks very much, Andrew, uh, for that overview of Project Nexus. We're going to dive down into some specifics, but first, let's hear from you, Vasu, because you also have experience in India linking uh, payment systems. And if you could speak a little bit about the experience with uh, India and Singapore links. What have you learned from that? How does it work first? And what have you learned from that? Thank you. Actually, in India, we do have uh, two fast payment systems. And India, in India, we do believe that each of the payment systems should be interoperable as well. So there is always an element of APIs that get exchanged between these two payment systems. Now, when we go into a cross-border arrangement, say, between India and Singapore, we are looking at a system which is going to talk maybe in two different languages and also in two different currencies with two different expectations in terms of time zones. How do we handle that? And when I look at, say, UPI as an Indian fast payment system, UPI is a population scale payment system. Per day, it handles 200 million transactions. And when we look at India, Singapore, Singapore has a pay now, that's a fast payment system. But the use case that we are looking at is to target the remittances that actually flow in between Singapore and India. India, uh, you all must be aware, is the largest recipient of remittances, $87 billion in 2021. And when the Singapore and India corridor gets connected, so we can have these remittances happen faster, quicker, cheaper, and all the benefits are there. But again, what happens when we are, say, using these two fast payment systems, they may be using APIs among themselves to talk to the domestic participants. But when these two have to come together, we have to have some harmonization. So we are looking at, say, harmonization of the API standards between, say, the Indian and Singapore systems. So when we 
have to tomorrow go from these bilateral systems to a multilateral systems, we need to go for increased harmonization of the API standards. And when we have this harmonization, we are looking at benefits like configuring the API data exchange protocols, the data dictionaries, the safety protocols, and all these measures are all part of the API standards. And how much of a message or how much of a data should go into a particular API message, how much of a latency it should have before it actually closes the transaction, all those things are there. And the APIs can be used for, say, for example, checking my KYC or AML and CFT eligibility and the requirements as per the cross uh, as per the country. Also, make the entire process uh, STP straight through processing. And when we have APIs harmonization happening, then we also look at they being network neutral, whether it's on the public network, private network, or even on the internet, it can still function. And definitely, when we have harmonization, we can also expect the bilateral platforms to become multilateral because the other country can just adopt these standards and then become part of the system. Otherwise, it's going to be tough. When I look at, say, a, between India and uh, Singapore, now we are looking at whether to have a single currency settlement system or a multi-currency settlement system, whether to have a single bank that operates on both sides or multiple banks, how the banks will connect to each other, whether we will have a private uh, cloud or a virtual private network. Those are the aspects that are getting into, plus the legal aspects that are very, very critical because each one will have their own legal expectations in terms of how many participants are going to be there, what are the rules and responsibilities of each of them. And when we talk about legal, we also have the different regulatory and supervisory frameworks in each of the systems and different access criteria as well. So how to harmonize this becomes a significant challenge on which we are working. And definitely the aspect about cost will also come in here because one of the expectations of a G20 cross-border payments program is also about reducing cost. So how do we bring down the cost? How do we convince the participants who are public and private? How do we make them understand that this is a public good infrastructure, the cost can become secondary? Because unless and until this infrastructure is leveraged and payments become the source of say, formal funds coming into the bank accounts, there are so many other avenues that can be used by the banks to actually provide more services. So it becomes a significant challenge. And believe me, just on the legal part, I am saying that it has taken around three months to settle between the lawyers on both sides, how to draft the agreement and what are the contents of that. Sometimes the expectations are that a bilateral arrangement is already made, tomorrow you make it multilateral, it's not going to be so simple. I am sure we will uh, leverage on the project nexus, but I also feel that the India-Singapore could also give some learnings to Project Nexus. We could actually use these to see that the subsequent linkages that happen can benefit from both. We don't want anybody else to learn from the same mistakes we go through. So I'm, I'm actually very bullish about these linkages. I am bullish that this is a way forward. Fast payments have to talk to each other irrespective of how they have configured, who has configured, they have to always come to play. So I, I will stop here and then maybe we'll go forward on the discussions as they come up. Thank you, Asu. You've, you've said a lot. And let's go <clears throat> step by step. And uh, the first thing that you were uh, talking about is really the, call it the housekeeping services. So you, you gather the information that you need on, on users, uh, you gather the information that you need on the payment that needs to be made, um, you, you gather that information through the APIs, you might automate that that's great. And then you have uh, two uh, settlements that are done. There's a settlement in country A uh, through the country A's fast payment system. There's a settlement can, in country B through country B's fast payment system. But something magical happens in the middle. And that something magical is the exchange of currencies. There's a foreign exchange transaction that happens in the middle. Why don't we focus on that? What happens there? What is, what is that complicated foreign exchange transaction that happens uh, that links, really, that serves as a bridge between these two domestic uh, settlements that happen through the fast payment systems? Um, Andrew, perhaps you'd like to say a little bit about the models of these foreign exchange transactions that happen in the middle. Yeah, I mean, so this is a critical piece, and obviously we're, we're getting into some detail here, but um, you know, the lifeblood of a payment system is liquidity. And in a multi-currency uh, system, that implies certainly the prominent role for foreign exchange provision, right? Um, the, the also, one of the key frictions uh, associated with the cross-border roadmap that was identified was the cost of payments. And if you really unpack it, that foreign exchange piece can be one of the primary drivers of cost. 
And so if we think about you know, the opportunity of, of creating a bilateral and multilateral arrangement, one of the things that we've been spending some time on is thinking about how to make that FX provision and liquidity provision more of a competitive marketplace. Um, easy to say, hard to do, but that's the vision for what we would like to accomplish. So when you've done that payment, hello, um, you know, so, so you're at that stage where you, you want to, you know, the user, whether it's a or a would like to, sorry, my microphone's going a little bit crazy here. Um, the, the, the user needs to be quoted a rate. So in, in our model, we're thinking about, oh, how do we make that rate quoting process somewhat of a competitive marketplace, and how do we onboard FX providers and liquidity providers to allow that to happen? And that, there's a lot of work to happen there, but I think that's ultimately the direction we would like to go so that, so that there is a, the opportunity to create some competition and ultimately some benefits to the end consumer as a result. Um, but once that rate is established and, and uh, the, the transaction can effectively seamlessly flow from there, it's, it, you've kind of gotten over the hard parts, which is the identification of the beneficiary and the sender, the sanction screening and the automation around that, which is you know FATF and travel rule uh, related, and, and that's important, and then the establishment of the FX rate uh, and the liquidity in each environment to execute the transaction. Once you have it all set up there, the rest is actually pretty straightforward. Yeah, if I can just make a point as well. For example, uh, it could actually, the, the bilateral arrangements or the multilateral arrangements could actually benefit from whatever expectations are there from either of the countries. For example, if the central bank is willing to open the accounts of other central banks with itself, or if one single bank is operating in either of the jurisdictions or both the jurisdictions, or if you are preferring to have multiple settlement banks in each of the jurisdictions. So multiple models could be actually put in place because of these arrangements. See, even in the currency context, there is a dynamic currency conversion that happens instantaneously when a payment is made, or you could also have an exchange rate freeze for say for 24 hours or 48 hours, depending on how the arrangements are. So what I get as a beneficiary will be the same as what my bank will get as a beneficiary bank. So that could happen. So we could actually address the issues of forex volatility in these fashions because of these uh, arrangements that will be bilateral, mutually acceptable. But in a way, you're painting two very, very different systems. One system is the foreign exchange rate falls from the sky. It doesn't really fall from the sky. It comes from a foreign exchange market that is active outside of these arrangements and you basically trade given that foreign exchange rate, and you can fix it during the day, there are various options. The other option is to actually have a foreign exchange market, to have banks providing liquidity actually provide foreign exchange quotes. You're, you would be proposing to create a new foreign exchange market. Is, is that right? I mean, it's, it's, it's meant to be um, a very tightly managed market. It's not, it's not a, an open capital market by any means, but it's a, it's a mechanism that we think is necessary. And we do think it can be configured in a way that's um, got a lot of different permutations and combinations. So for example, a, a large global bank who has liquidity in, in, a, in a number of currencies in a number of jurisdictions and uh, uh, maybe even directly participating in, in, in fast payment systems uh, in the network, um, has a natural opportunity to you know, recycle that liquidity and provide value to maybe their customers, obviously, but potentially even other banks' customers if, if they can play that role. Um, other arrangements could be made where there are you know, quasi-correspondent relationships established with a foreign exchange provider who's willing to do the rate quoting, but the liquidity provision through, through their correspondent relationships. And so in the Nexus model, we've, we've tried to sort of break down all the permutations and combinations that are possible, but the express purpose of this mini little marketplace, if you will, is, is really just to support the execution of the real-time payments transactions, and it's not meant to be uh, a replacement for the kind of large volume, high value uh, FX markets that exist in any way, shape, or form. One point I just want to mention is when we are looking at these fast payment systems or any payment systems being linked, the transactions happen instantaneously, but the fund settlement happens later. So we always have the benefit of a net settlement happening there. So the liquidity requirements come down so much so immediately. And we can even tailor this to have, say, multiple settlements in a day so that the credit and 
the financial risks, even settlement risks, are brought down to the minimum. I know uh, the IMF is concerned about liquidity and those risks emanating from that, but the fast payment systems and the interlinkages, interoperability actually do not add much, much risks to the system, but actually they give, they give more comfort in terms of the quicker access to funds, both for banks and for the individuals, and more intermediaries not being there. The fewer the intermediaries, probably the less lower will be the dependency on liquidity and such arrangements. So I feel this is a very effective way of uh, facilitating uh, gross settlement system at the top between two individuals and a net settlement system between the two banks because you have the advantage of uh, netting out the expectations of inflow and outflow. Is that the same vision in Nexus? Yeah, largely. So the, 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 the concept is, you know, with Investing in a domestic fast payment system is a significant effort, um, obviously. Uh, it's a multi-year program, and as part of that development, each country makes decisions on what the risk model would actually be for those domestic payments and the settlement of those payments. In many countries, most countries, it's a deferred net settlement type of model where maybe the system settles every two or four hours, whatever the case may be. It's collateralized properly, and it's overseen by usually the central bank. Um, in some countries, they've actually adopted a real-time gross settlement uh, mechanism, even for fast payments. So, for example, in Australia, uh, that's the case. So, so Nexus does not try to impose anything. It actually just builds a top, and we, had, we worked really hard to make sure that it was agnostic to each country's settlement modality. Um, if you're net deferred net settlement, that's fine. If you're real-time gross like you are in Australia, that's fine. Um, what's really critical is that the payments are immediate and final. Uh, and the settlement in those jurisdictions just follows whatever they're doing today, frankly. Um, obviously, there is still this question of, you know, how does that liquidity provider and FX relationship, you know, fully settle in between, but that's a separate conversation. Okay. So one of the things I've uh, learned in the last days in Indonesia is to add zeros to everything that I pay for. Uh, I'm not used to being a millionaire. Um, but it's, it's wonderful to be one for a few days. Um, now, we're talking retail payment systems. Uh, we're talking small value uh, payments. payments. Um, in the middle here, we have the large banks and liquidity providers that are used to uh, very large transactions. They are used to moving millions of dollars uh, in, in transactions. Can you get their attention? Uh, can you get them to participate? Can you get them to be interested? in these retail payment systems? Can, can you get them to provide the liquidity that you need? Is that an issue? How do you overcome it? Whoever knows the answer. No, no, actually, it's not so difficult to have everyone participate because over a period of time, people have accepted the fact that public and private entities need to come together. They are seeing the impact of the uh, uptake of these payment systems in their other activities as well. For, I always feel that payments is the one entry or the gateway for other financial activities or services to be provided. And they can't actually keep their hands out. That's why we are seeing, seeing the fintechs, the big techs all entering the payment space. And each one is competing with the other and actually it's all benefiting the consumer. So there is no maybe choice or chance for the people to stay out. Today or tomorrow they have to come in. Because sometimes if you see the small values also add up to the big numbers. It's not that the big numbers only show up the balance sheets. The small values also are very critical because these pieces are actually adding to the jigsaw puzzle. The, 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 if you don't see the large banks only competing, we have the small retail banks who also provide universal banking access services, so they also compete. So I'm not seeing that as a major uh, concern at all. And especially in India, when we look at inclusion and accessibility, it's, a, it's an objective which everybody fo follows. And one of the beauty um, uh, of the report, which I, we have just mentioned, uh, for which I am here, is about these questions that are there at the end, uh, to ask each one as to whether these operators or entities who are uh, like implementing these arrangements, you have to ask these questions to see how do you start with it. There is no harm in starting with the big banks and then involving the small banks as we go ahead as well. So you have to see which is the critical piece. So we have in the report almost 75 questions across nine main parameters that can be asked and those solutions are good enough for any system to start implementing and go ahead. So I feel it's a win-win and everybody will participate. Just a few thoughts. I fully agree with Vasu's comments. And, and you know, when we have spoken to the really large banks, there is that sort of divide between the FX trading desks and the payment folks. And they're not necessarily talking to each other. And especially when there's less zeros involved, that 
the Treasury and the FX guys get a little less interested. But um, we do see that, that those silos breaking down and kind of the acknowledgement of these different channels and opportunities to participate and add value. Uh, and so we've, we've heard that from them. We also have spoken to some of these sort of fintechs who specialize in actually doing exactly this type of function, who provide, um, you know, real-time FX and liquidity in a variety of different markets and, 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 and on a scale that, you know, they can be profitable at lower dollar denominations and lower values. And so there's at least a handful of them who are very, very much active in, in the kind of space that certainly we're talking about already today. Very interesting. Thank you very much. So let's move slightly to a different topic. This is a slightly drier topic. We won't spend too much time on it, and I promise you we'll get to a more exciting question after that. But Vasu, also when you were speaking a little bit about your own experiences in India, you mentioned the importance of legal uh, standards, legal agreements. Uh, can you unpack that for us a little bit and give us a sense of the difficulty uh, of setting up these arrangements and the time that may be needed to do so. So actually when we look at these arrangements like legal, I made it very simple when I said legal, but actually it also involves the regulatory and the oversight frameworks. And when we talk about legal agreements, etc., we also look at the governance. Now who is going to administer these arrangements? Who is going to take care of the access criteria? Now when we talk about access criteria, we are looking at entry. But when we talk about access, we also have to see how are these players who are rogue or non-compliant, they also exit the system. So what are the access criteria that can be made public and it is followed in both the countries simultaneously. Especially when we are looking at these geopolitical risks and other concerns coming in, the governance becomes the critical piece. And for that, the technical teams can talk, but the people in the policy teams need also to understand that there are the clear set of rules and service level agreements which we have to comply with. And this becomes complicated as we become multilateral from bilateral. So the governance piece like the uh, BIS, the CPMI, the innovation hub, these people somewhere we have to have these standard setting types of people who can say that yes, I am going to administer this criteria. It becomes so much so important. Maybe the ASEAN, maybe the SARC Payments Council, there are those regional bodies that are there. But it becomes critical that each country does not become a big brother to the other and then other country finds it difficult to impose the public rules that have been laid down. And because everybody is watching, the consumers are watching, the people in either jurisdictions are watching, so it becomes a critical piece. I know governance is a dry subject, but governors are important and these arrangements are also very critical for these bilateral engagements to come in. Um, thanks very much. So I, I asked you a, a dry question and I was going to ask you an exciting question. And you answered my exciting question, which was, you know, the, the governance uh, in terms of who participates, uh, who decides who can participate, who gets kicked out of these systems. That's also important. And who decides that? Uh, that's the, in fact, the exciting and the difficult uh, questions. Um, Andrew, do you have views on that? Who, who decide, who makes those decisions? Well, obviously, so we, we do think that for any multilateral arrangement to be successful, you do need, um, you need a governing organization. You need a body. Um, we've been studying some of the examples that we've been, out, you know, been able to find out there in the wild, and, and, and we do see some interesting um, you know, examples. Um, from a scheme governance uh, perspective, we, we've actually studied what the EPC does in, in, in Europe, right? They, they, you know, the SEPA scheme is, is, their, is their baby and, and they kind of govern the evolution of the scheme uh, and including the instant payment kind of evolution of that. Um, but that's less of an operational construct, right? Because they're more making sure the standard is, is well-defined and available to European uh, jurisdictions. Um, from an operational perspective, you know, we think also that there is good governance on the domestic instant payment landscape. And, and really, we'd like to uh, leverage on that as well, so that to say that you know, if you have a domestic fast payment system, decisions have been made already as to who can participate. Right? Are we going to allow banks only, or are we going to allow banks and non-banks? And what's the regulatory perimeter that allows for that you know that heterogeneous group to participate directly in that fam fast payment system? we would like to, to not change that, actually. We would say, look, that's a great decision. As long as we all agree on what the minimum bar is in terms of the risk model and the oversight, then that should be 
good enough to sort of delegate some of those decisions as to who's, who's in and out, as long as we all agree on what the minimum standard is from a regulatory perspective. Um, so I think that's an opportunity. Then, you know, to Vasu's point, you know, compliance uh, with, with the scheme um, and the rules and having processes and protocols to deal with situations that um, when the rules are not adhered to and, and, and compliance with and exit strategies, uh, super critical, has to be operationalized. Uh, again, you need an entity to do that. And then the governance of the entity itself um, is a very delicate uh, subject. So that's kind of, we kind of think about it in, 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 a, in layers. So hopefully that answers your question. No, certainly. Um, and we've spoken a little bit about bilateral links. We've spoken about multilateral links, at least on a regional basis, and we heard uh, this morning the commitment to do this at the level of uh, the ASEAN 5. But are these systems scalable? Can we imagine uh, including many more countries than five? Um, and the question is really a technical one and one about governance as well. So do you see these scale uh, in the future? Basu, first. Yeah, as I just mentioned, uh, like UPI, the fast payment system in India, handles significant numbers of volumes. So we are very comfortable even if it scales up to any number because we are looking at a billion a day architecture actually, billion transactions a day. So we are very comfortable even if multiple jurisdictions come into play. The fact remains that once the technical uh, configurations are all in place, the scale may not matter so much, but the bandwidth and the system resources need to be upscaled as and when these things are there. So we have those cloud and other infrastructures that can be leveraged, but it's definitely an important question we need to be uh, mindful of. And uh, the, the reputation risks now transcend between the, the two countries. For example, if some, uh, some failure were to happen within the country, it may not have such international ramifications, but if between two corridors these issues happen, then the reputation risks are significant. So we have to definitely take care of the scalability issues. We need to be having the plan B, etc. because as I was mentioning, the RTGS as uh, was being talked in the morning is typically common for five hours in a day across the globe. But how do we ensure that these overlaps do not, or this lack of overlaps do not cross friction? So scalability is absolutely essential and the host countries need to be comfortable that their systems can handle the, all these volumes. And one more issue I just want to highlight when we talk about scalability is the cyber security issues. Because these systems have been ring fenced so much, now if two systems talk to each other, how do we ring fence the cyber security aspect as well? So that becomes a very critical piece. So sometimes you may have to create one more instance for this within the database so that the two systems talk to each other comfortably. But uh, absolutely, I agree with you. Very, very crucial aspect we should not lose sight of is scalability. Um, yeah, not, not much to add. I mean, obviously, India is the gold standard in terms of scalability. The, 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 the volumes being processed on UPI and IMPS are, are you know, off the charts, literally. Um, so, so it can be done, for sure. Most countries probably would, would still need quite some time to scale to those volumes. Uh, you know, by definition, there's just not that many transactions in Canada or, or, or Singapore as it would be in India, obviously. Um, but that being said, I do think that cross-border transactions will always be, um, um, you know, a, a lower percentage of overall volume regardless, right? So the, the, the vast majority of transactions will still be domestic, and that's what the infrastructure has to support. And I think cross-border sort of an overlay service or a, a complementary service that, that will add some volume, but it, it shouldn't be the straw that breaks the back, you know, the, the system. There's one important uh, theme that this conference has discussed is financial inclusion. There was an entire day dedicated to financial inclusion yesterday. Um, and today we've spoken about cross-border payments and you've laid out a picture, a very enticing picture of how that might work in the future. Can we join the two? Um, the architecture that we've discussed, I think, relies on having a bank account. Um, is that an issue? Can you overcome that? And can you make uh, cross-border payments also accessible to those that are unbanked uh, through these schemes that we've been discussing? Vasu, do you want to start? Yeah, actually, I believe financial inclusion has to be there, but it need not be always uh, like the non-bank accounts and the bank accounts have to exist together. Many a time this question has been posed whether your systems can allow non-bank accounts to be accessible as well. 
but I feel that there is more to actually benefit from if everybody is given a bank account. In whichever way it can be, be it a small uh, basic minimum or no frill account, in whichever way it can be, it's always good to give a bank account to everyone. And maybe, uh, maybe like we have done, give it free of charge for certain basic transactions, five transactions a month or for certain features, you provide them free of cost. Over a period, there have been significant benefits because when we see, see for example, the direct benefit transfers that need to be given during the pandemic and otherwise, if it's to the bank account, there is so much of spillage we can avoid. And people can actually leverage that money coming into the back account for various other purposes as well. So I feel while the debate is good whether we can include non-banks, definitely we can include non-banks. But I feel the thrust should be on giving bank accounts to everyone so that the, the access becomes universal and uniform to everyone. That I feel is real financial inclusion actually. Yeah, a, a, a strong agreement again here. But And maybe one, another way to think about it is that, that regulatory perimeter that I described earlier, certainly you know, acts, making it possible to have bank accounts available to everyone, but then acknowledging that there are these you know, digital wallet providers that maybe serve a, a role in this, in this discussion. And, and then it's a question of making sure that perimeter expands to include those, those, those digital wallets. So they're well regulated and overseen and effectively the same, same rules, regulation, same, you know, the same rules, same regulations in terms of, okay, it's not a, technically a bank account, but it's basically overseen and, and governed and regulated like one. And now we can talk about bringing that into the fast payment system. And now you've got kind of the complete story that we're trying to tell. So I think that's possible as well. So, in fact, your answer is as long as these non-bank service providers are included in the domestic fast payment system, then bingo, they can be part of the cross-border scheme uh, just as easily. That, that's our hope and expectation and, and appreciating that the, the trick to cross-border is, is federating trust across borders. And so we have to make sure that, that again, that governance and that, that scheme rule set are, are well acknowledged and agreed upon by all participants and, and, that, and that that framework can be established. But yeah, that would be the goal. Yeah, I, I just want to say that future is very exciting and the future of fast payment systems is truly very, very exciting. And I would also love to be in the same country as you are, that is Bali. But then if you have to have cross-border, then I be in India and you be in Bali, we can still discuss and exchange transactions. Thank you very much. I completely agree. That's a great note to end on. This is an extremely exciting uh, area, one of uh, very fast growth. And I think uh, hopefully you've been able to get more of a tangible picture of how this might look like, thanks to our wonderful speakers today, uh, having heard earlier this morning a commitment on the part of the governors to make this happen. So thank you very, very much for listening. I'm sorry that we didn't have time to take questions from the audience. I encourage you to stick around and ask questions bilaterally if you'd like. Uh, we'll be here on stage. Please join me for a very warm... There are two questions is what I see from the screen. Oh. The screen was beeping red, so I thought that we were out of time. But the screen says we have two time for two questions. So please, anybody uh, interested in asking a question? Yes, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I would like to um, uh, ask uh, Andrew from PIS Innovation Hub. Uh, what challenges have you encountered in developing the Project Nexus initiative and how will central banks and the business sector collaborate to make this plan happen? Thank you. I think there was a question for Project Nexus. It's a little difficult to hear the questions up here on stage. There's some echo, but... Yeah, just to make sure I got the question, you know, anticipating some of the, the challenges that, that might be involved in trying to make the dream come true. <laughs> um, well, I think we've touched on quite some number of the challenges that we expect. Uh, obviously, uh, starting from the top, there has to be some uh, clear, um, clear view as to what the governance of the arrangement would look like. Uh, the, the maintenance and development and maintenance of a, of a scheme rule set and a legal framework to allow um, to allow all participants to be bound together. 
um, the technical standards and the interoperability and the protocols to actually you know execute um, critically the the you know the buy-in and alignment with the private sector um, you know when you talk about account to account payments you literally are talking about bank account to bank account or potentially digital wallet account payments so um, you need their uh, you know direct and active engagement uh, as well as you need to figure out how to make sure that there's a compelling um, business opportunity for the private sector so you know notwithstanding the fact that our goal is to provide you know faster safer cheaper more transparent payments uh, we still have to acknowledge that there needs to be uh, a sustainable business kind of architecture that, that allows for this to happen uh, achieve the public purpose goals but also allow for incentives for the private sector to participate um, and, and to invest in, in, in the project and, and develop the, the tools and channels that have to be developed for their customers. Um, I think it's also interesting to think about the overlay services. You know, most people don't know the name of the fast payment system in their country, and, and most people shouldn't. Most people shouldn't know the name of, of, of Nexus or whatever the cross-border thing ends up being. Um, people know the, the brands that they're their service providers offer them. And, and, and so this infrastructure vision actually should allow for that. It should allow for branded services to be built on top. It should allow for meaningful opportunities for the private sector to provide liquidity and, and make some reasonable profit. But, but hopefully, you know, hopefully, hopefully reasonable being the key word, and, uh, but it's a matter of incentives. So there's so much there to unpack and, and so many dimensions to, to implementing and executing this, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, though not addressed to me, I just want to add a point that the challenges will always be there. So like the moderator in the previous session, the assistant governor was mentioning, a thousand mile journey starts with a small step. We could actually start looking at small features to be interlinked. Going forward, we can have more complications, more trade payments, large value payments, etc., all being made part of these systems. So it's always ni nice to start. And then we can look at the challenges as we face as well. So sometimes we need not be bogged down by the issues beforehand. I, I do agree we have to be prepared, but it's very difficult to be prepared for everything. I was prepared for rains in Bali. It's not there. So it's like that. <laughs> All right. We have time for one more question. Yes, please. And if you, when asking your question, if you could speak slowly, because there's echo here on stage. We have trouble understanding. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Hopefully, my, you can hear my voice very clear. Okay. Um, thank you for the insightful panels. Um, my question may not be directly related with the, with, with the uh, uh, context of the, uh, of the discussion, but if I may, I would like to try my luck. Uh, from the point of view of the operational resiliency, uh, would the interlinking RTGS have different consequences compared with interlinking retail payment system. Uh, one of the considerations about this is the, the RTGS is directly serve the uh, financial system, uh, financial system which is instrumental for the uh, financial system stability as well as the monetary transmission. So which one, on your point of view, which one is more urgent at this moment in terms of our effort uh, to improve cross-border payment efficiency? So my question is uh, to both uh, panels, if I may. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A great question. So this morning, we heard the managing director, Ravi Menon, say, we're going to proceed step by step. Well, first, we're going to interlink um, retail fast payment systems. And then we're going to interlink RTGSs. So does it make a difference? Uh, Vasu, why don't we start with you? Yeah, actually, it does make a difference because the complexities change significantly. A, in the case of fast payment systems, it's all about volumes. Significant numbers get exchanged between the two countries or between two systems when they are interoperable and interlinked. And when we talk about RTGS, let me be honest, let me be frank, RTGSs are typically run by central banks and some of them are, most of them are legacy systems. They may not use APIs, they also are not so conducive to these arrangements instantaneously. And the RTGS systems also handle large value transactions. So the issue of liquidity, the issue of how to handle these transactions between members in two countries, et cetera, come in. So I feel the complexities are different, but we should start with some visible benefit from these interlinkages. So I would suggest that we start with fast payment systems. Then we can always expand the comfort and convenience to the large value that RTGS. Honestly said, large value transfers or large value RTGS transactions benefit the banks more. 
and the corporates. And the small value fast payment systems benefit the consumers and individuals more. So I feel we should target this and we can always look at that later. Because the countries can uh, actually uh, take care of the corporates. Corporates have consultants, corporate have accounts in both countries, anything they can do, but the individuals have difficulties. So I agree the complexities are there. We have to be careful of that. We have to take care of certain other precautions. I did mention cyber security. We have to take care of BCP. We have to take care of the access criteria, the access operating hours, et cetera. Multiple challenges are there. So when we interlink with BFAST and UPI, we can discuss about all these things. Yeah, great points, uh, Vasu. Uh, when I was responsible for running the RTGS in Canada, the system was 24 years old and running on a mainframe, and it took us quite some effort, obviously, um, you know, get rid of the technical debt associated with the system itself. But that's not the real issue. I mean, it's an issue for sure. But but if you look at the participation of an RTGS in any country, it's a very very limited subgroup of you know very you know your your top tier banks basically usually. Some countries are a little more generous, but it's a very um, select group that get that type of direct access. Um, but if you look at the participation. Um, uh, of a fast payment system, it's, it's vastly more diverse and, and more inclusive usually. So you go from dozens of uh, direct participants to potentially hundreds of direct participants. And so from that perspective, it seems logical to start with the fast payments because it's, a, it's by definition a more uh, accessible uh, uh, payment rail. Uh, and 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 potentially you know less risky from that perspective because you know the, the RTGS is a an embodiment of the central bank balance sheet at the end of the day and and that that's a very privileged place to be. Yeah, I just want to add a point that I'll be doing a great injustice if I don't mention that in India the RTGS is 24 by 7. We have adopted the ISO 2022 in 2014, and we have non-banks also accessing the RTGS. So we have all these features already ready. So we welcome any more settlements to happen on RTGS. As well. Bring it on, says Vasu, <laughs> bring it on. Uh, we, we are just getting another message from the organizers. It's a, it's a, it's a great um, testimony, I think, to the quality of this panel. We're being allowed one more question from the audience. So one more. Uh, who has a hand from back there? Yes, please. Yeah, so they don't want to let us go from Bali or from the stage, I said. Make I'm us, enjoying this very hard. much. So. <laughs> Well, okay, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it was a very fruitful presentation, and I would like to ad address my questions to Mr. Fasu Devan. Uh, okay, my questions are, what are the next steps for the authorities and industries to reach the building blocks 13 and 15 desired state? And then, what are their roles and responsibilities? And the last one is, how far are we from the desired state? Thank you. See, it, actually, it will have taken the, uh, me one more panel round to answer the questions. But honestly, I feel that each of the stakeholders have to just fulfill their roles as members, as participants. Sometimes they do participate on behalf of their clients. Sometimes they do participate on their own behalf as well. So each one has to play by the rule. And the next steps are definitely for the building blocks we are looking at. How to, uh, from the API building block, we are looking at how to go for harmonization. Who are all the people whom we can look at to provide these inputs? Because incidentally, when we are doing the, when we were doing the stock take, when we are compiling the report, we find that each of the countries have adopted their own practices and standards, and there is no global agency or group that can be like uh, looked at for support. Even at the regional level, there are no such groups. So we will probably be looking at and reaching out to these groups to see that how they can support us in having these harmonized standards. And here, again, we need the industry participants, because some of these payment systems are quite large, and some of them are in, uh, like siloed participation. So they do not want to share anything as well. So we do expect that all the players look at these systems as public good infrastructure, participate wholeheartedly, not to expect to earn revenue from every transaction. So these are the expectations. And when we are inter looking at interlinking, I just made another point earlier that only 10 percent of the payment systems are presently interlinked or interoperable. There are bilateral engagements. So 90 percent still remains. So the world is out open. And I'm sure many of these arrangements which are now there can be transformed, transcended into becoming these global systems as was being discussed earlier. So the scope is enormous. So Bali is just the beginning. Bali is just the beginning. You've heard it today uh, at this wonderful conference. Thank you very, very much.
for your attendance. Thank you to our speakers. This was a great event. Thank you to the moderator for provoking us. So. Thank you very much, Mr. Grifoli, Mr. McCormack, and Mr. Vasuvedan for the very insightful session. Please remain seated on stage to capture this moment together with a group photo session. On my marks, give your warmest smile to the camera. One, two, three. One more time. One, two, three. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for this very wonderful and inspiring session. You may return to your seats. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, moving on to the next agenda, we would like to hear some more insights regarding cross-border payments from the point of view of our industry's representative. And so I would like to introduce you, Mr. Kartika Wiryoatmojo, Chairman of Perbanas. Mr. Kartika, the virtual stage is yours. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Excellency, Governor of Bank Indonesia, Governor of Bank Negara Malaysia, Governor of the Banco Central in Filipinas, Governor of Bank of Thailand, Managing Director, Monetary Authority of Singapore, and all the honorable participants put in Bali and attending this event online. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Kartika Wirimojo. I'm the Chairman of Perbanas, Indonesian Banking Association. It is such an honor to speak on behalf of the Private Banking Association in Indonesia on this wonderful event. COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated transformation in various sectors and changes in customer behavior, including in the banking industry. Banks must provide customers with simple, fast, and reliable payment services. To support ease of transactions by Indonesia, collaborating with ASPI, the Indonesian Association for Payment System, continues to encourage the implementation of Quick Response Indonesia Standard, or QRIS. A QR standard used for various payment services to create a cashless society ecosystem. As of May 2022, Bank Indonesia recorded that the number of merchant members of the QRS reached 18.7 million. Cross-border QR has an opportunity to grow even more passively if the platform market is expanded further, at least in the Asian region with a potential population of over 650 million people. This will potentially boost the economy of the SME and the tourism sectors. One of the central bank's strategic initiatives is implementing cross-border payment to facilitate transactions between countries. Bank of Indonesia has collaborated with Bank Negara Malaysia and Bank of Thailand and has tested implementation of cross-border QR codes. Through these collaborations, it is possible to make payment using QR with the currency of the country of origin in another country. In the future, Bank Indonesia will cooperate with other Asian countries, namely Singapore and Philippines, through Asian payment connectivity. Challenges in cross-border payments include infrastructure readiness, and time differences for settlement between countries. Fortunately, implementing open banking API can overcome these constraints, simplify bank-to-bank -bank payments, and authorize payment in a few clicks. Open banking is creating new possibilities for businesses to reach a global market and overcome the complexities of local payment cultures. In Indonesia, the development of the open banking API has been implemented by several banks, such as PRI, Mandiri, BNI, BCA, CIB Niaga, and several others. This is also one of the potential revenue streams for banks in the B2B segment. Cross-border QR payments are cheaper, more efficient, and without additional costs. Customers abroad are no longer need to exchange using money changers or withdraw money on overseas ATMs and get real-time payments. Perbanas supports this payment system initiative to encourage and optimize the innovation of banking services. Cross-border QR implementation is a future initiative to improve transaction efficiency and maintain economic stability by certain transaction using local currency settlement or LCS. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe widespread acceptance of QR payment is essential for the future of digital payment as an important aspect 
of global economic growth and economic recovery. Hopefully, the moment of this G20 meeting can strengthen the collaboration among global policymakers to provide solutions related to cross-border payments for the greater good for the worldwide community. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Mr. Kartika, for your overview. And ladies and gentlemen, now let's continue to the next industries, industries view. And so I would like to invite virtually Mr. Pandu Shahrir, Chairman of Indonesian FinTech Association. Mr. Pandu, the virtual stage is yours. Warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. May peace be upon us all. Shalom, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya. Greetings of virtue. Good morning and greetings to the Governor of Bank Indonesia, Bapak Peri Warjio, Governor of Bank Negara Malaysia, Ms. Nur Samsiah Mot Yunus, Governor of Bank of Thailand, Mr. Setaput Sutiwar Trandropu, Managing Director of Monetary Authority of Singapore, Mr. Ravi Menon, Governor of Banco Central and Filipinas, Mr. Felipe Medalia, Board of Deputy Governors from Bank Indonesia, Board of Deputies from Coordinating Ministry of Economic Affairs, College colleagues from ASPI, Perbanas, and Kadin. Distinguished guests participating both live from Bali International Convention Center as well as those joining online. Allow me first to congratulate Bank Indonesia Governor Bapak Peri Warjio, along with Board of Deputy Governors, Coordinating Minister of Economic Affairs, Bapak Erlangga Hartarto, along with Board of Deputies and colleagues from ASPI, Perbanas, and Kadin for the successful delivery of Festival Ekonomi Keuangan Digital Indonesia 2022. It has been a week of celebration for payment industry players to be able to showcase the development of Indonesia's economic and finance ecosystem to delegates of the G20 member state, as well to boost digital finance literacy to Balinese people. I would like to give also a special mention to the governor of Bali, Bapak Iwayan Koster, and uh, Pemda Bali for the support given to this event. Going back to the G20 finance track, Aptex is excited to see cross-border payment amongst the priority agenda. I remember giving a testimony about QR cross-border during its pre-launch back in August 2021 and how time has flown so fast that Indonesia have implemented the QR cross-border pilot project with Bank of Thailand and Bank Negara Malaysia. We see and embrace the economic potential that resulted from easier cross-payment. Several of our members, such as Dana Indonesia, Doku, Linkaja, Shopee Pay, and others, have been participating in the implementation of PR cross-border pilot project with the Bank of Thailand. We are looking forward to successful delivery of the pilot project and wider implementation of such initiatives. We can also assure you the fintech industry's commitment as well as participation to fully optimize commercial opportunity originating from a more connected world, particularly for the benefit of all of our MSMEs. Similar to other initiatives in the digital finance ecosystem, Implementation of QR cross-border also comes with risk, such as cyber attacks, data breach, and fraud. On this subject, we are committed to work with regulators, industry players, and also other stakeholders to ensure that innovation and growing trade, as well as commercial activities, followed by consumer protection via adoption of governance, risk, and compliance principles. Distinguished guests, collaboration among all relevant stakeholders is the only way to realize our common goal to establish a swift, affordable, easy to use, safe, and reliable Indonesian payment system as one of the solutions to recover together, recover stronger. AFTAC is looking forward to providing support, strengthen collaboration, and work with all of us in this matter. Again, as a final saying, Salam FinTech, Salam AFTAC. Greetings to all of you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. May peace be upon us all. Om Swastiastu Namo Buddhaya. Greetings of virtue. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Mr. Pandu, for your view regarding enhancing cross-border payments. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, finally, we have accomplished all of today's agenda, and let me deliver three key messages for you to conclude our discussion today. First, cross-border payments has become global priority. Cross-border payments is a priority initiative of the G20 Indonesia Presidency to overcome multi-dimensional and cross-border payment system challenges as well as provide fast, affordable, transparent and inclusive transaction services. 
Second, Asian Five Payment Connectivity is the new synergy power in the region. Asian Five collaboration is needed to promote economic recovery and financial integration in the region through increased efficiency, reduced costs, and improved user experience in cross-border payment. And the third, interlinkage is the key to cross-border payment. Broadening the interlinkages between infrastructures as well as integrating the existing bilateral agreements into broader collaborative framework and roadmap will serve as strong role model for cross-border payment. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, I am positive that the main key to success for all those three critical aspects lies in strong synergy and collaboration between central banks across jurisdictions, also partnership with private sector. As we have all been aware of, the synergy is better than my way or your way. It is our way. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause for FECD 2022 for marking the good collaboration and synergy between regulators and international organizations, as well as all industry players. At last, we would like to thank Governor of Bank Indonesia, Bapak Peri Warjio. Also, our distinguished speakers and moderators, and also our distinguished guests for participating in the fourth day of FECD 2022 cross-border payment session. We remind you that FECD 2022 event series is held for five days until July 15th, 2022. And after this, ladies and gentlemen, you can also join all showcases and the activities on the mini stage, including casual talk on local currency settlement, to get the new experience and journey for economic progress in Indonesia. On behalf of Bank Indonesia and all committee of Indonesian Financial Economic Festival 2022, I am Dazen Frila signing off. It's been an honor to host all of you today. And please enjoy the grand performance of Institut Seni Indonesia dan Pasar. Kawan, nyalakan matamu Simaklah dalam babang doyangmu
ของเธอลาผู้ลาผู้